There is, there is training involved in that for, for all the participants, yes. As the chief of police, what will be your priorities when a disaster occurs? Well, the priorities for, for police, fire, and public works during a local emergency will be the preservation of life, and that will be the very first priority. So depending upon the nature of the emergency, and hopefully we don't have one that comes to that magnitude, but if we do, whether it's collapsed buildings or structure fires or whatnot, um, our priority is going to be everything we can to save uh, uh, any lives that are in danger. That's the number one priority. Do you believe that people are prepared? You know, the good news is some are, but unfortunately many are not. Um, they're not prepared. And I think one of the reasons is because we don't, you know, a local emergency is an abstract idea to us that maybe many of us have never lived through, so it doesn't feel real. And maybe that's why we're not prepared. Also, some people might think it's, God, it's, it's kind of daunting. I've got to do all this stuff to get ready. And, um, and it's really not. So, you know, some are, but unfortunately too many are not. When I Googled uh, emergency <clears throat> preparedness, you can go online and get kits, and they have them all packaged up for you, yeah. right? That, that's what makes it easy. You can, you can sit at home and watch the Giants game and order all the stuff you need to prepare for a local emergency. You can go online to do it. So it is really very simple. And also, a lot of us are already kind of prepared. We have a lot of stuff at home that helps us prepare. For example, if you have any canned goods and things, then you've got food at home in the event of a local emergency, so you're good there. A lot of us keep bottled water at home, and um, we have water. We have blankets, flashlights, and things like that, so getting the kits ready is really not that daunting. But it's important that we all do it because in an emergency, as we talked about earlier, the priority of first responders is going to be in preservation, you know, the preservation of life, and they may not be available for other types of calls. Yeah, we have to fend for ourselves. Uh, you may. Yeah, and what, how much provision should we keep on hand? Are we talking about hours? <clears throat> Are we talking about days? Are we talking about weeks? You know, the standard in the past has been for 72 hours, and, um, but as they talk more and more about it, they really recommend five, it's really becoming more recommended five days. So I would recommend that people have about five days worth of living supplies um, in the event of a local emergency that you can handle yourself for five days. Uh, because if it is very severe, the likelihood of a first responder coming to your place if, if you don't have a life-threatening emergency is very low. With regard to provisions like medicine, water, and food, mm -hmm. We should prepare for hours, for days, for weeks. Yeah, you know, they used to say like 72 hours, but really there's this conversation about maybe more like five days. And I think people should be prepared um, really to be self-sustaining for a period of about five days. We have to fend for ourselves. You may have to fend for yourselves. I mean, in terms of local emergency, all the first responders could be committed to uh, life-threatening situations, and they're not going to um, be responding to anything less than that for a good period of time, possibly, depending upon the scope and nature of the emergency. In a neighborhood, someone may not have a CERT team member who's, right. who will help in any situation. How can neighborhoods or even neighbors be proactive? You know, the first thing starts with ourselves. What are we doing to, um, in terms of personal responsibility to be personally prepared? And, you know, so one thing is don't, uh, don't make yourself and your home an emergency. Have your stuff taken care of. Don't create demands on first responders. And you can do that by being prepared, by learning how to shut off your gas.
Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I call to order the October 11th, 2021 City Council Successor Agency to the Redevelopment Agency Housing Authority Regular Meeting. Would you all please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of, America. of America and to the Republic, to the Republic which for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under, under God, God indivisible. indivisible with liberty, with liberty and, justice and justice for all. For all. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, are there any changes to the order of the agenda this evening? Nothing from staff this evening, Madam Mayor. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, now we'll move to uh, presentations. So uh, the first one is um, presenting a proclamation to Nicholas Brown with Boy Scout Troop 321 upon receiving his Eagle Scout Award. And uh, Crystal, is, is Nicholas with us this evening? Yes, there he is. Yes, I am here. Okay, terrific. Welcome, Nicholas. I'm gonna go ahead and read the proclamation and then I'm, I'm if you're open to it, would love to hear a few words about your project. Thank you. All right. So tonight we're honoring Nicholas Brown in recognition of achieving the Eagle Scout Award. Whereas the Boy Scouts of America is an organization of youth preparing themselves to be future citizens and leaders. And whereas the Boy Scouts is committed to fostering the traits of leadership and strength of character among its members. And whereas the Boy Scouts play a vital force in the lives of hundreds of youth in the city of San Carlos, guided by adult volunteers who have given generously of their time and talents. And whereas for his service project, the final requirement for the rank of Eagle Scout, Nicholas Brown utilized his leadership skills to organize and inspire his team while planning and managing the project to completion. And whereas the special and unique honor of achieving the highest award bestowed by the Boy Scouts was earned by Nicholas Brown of Troop 321 for building 30 outdoor wooden stools for Arroyo Upper Elementary School, which entailed fundraising for materials designing the stools and coordinating efforts to build them. And whereas Nicholas Brown's project provides a great benefit for Arroyo school students to be able to comfortably participate in their outdoor learning space. Now, therefore, it be, be resolved that I, Laura Palmer Lohan, mayor of the city of San Carlos, hereby congratulate Nicholas Brown on the attainment of the pre prestigious rank of Eagle Scout and commend him for his service and accomplishments as a member of the Boy Scouts of America dated this 11th day of October, 2021. Congratulations, Nicholas. Thank you. I'm very appreciative. Okay. So would you like to share with us a little bit about your project? Uh, absolutely. Um, so yeah, this project, uh, I don't remember exactly when. This was about last year. Uh, we were doing a, uh, this was a sort of like a service project uh, in this, uh, in the Arroyo Outdoor Learning Space. Uh, where I was approached by Mindy Hill, uh, who is in charge of that general area, I believe, or was. Uh, and uh, at that time, I was searching for an equal project. And she came to me and said, oh, well, we, we have a couple projects, if you would like to start one, that you can do. Uh, and afterward, uh, I, was, I had to email uh, Mindy Shelton, the principal, and uh, from there, we got, I got started with uh, designing each uh, of these stools. We made uh, approximately 30 of these, exactly 30 of these. Uh, and, uh, they, oh, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, so once uh, I was given like the go ahead uh, for this project, uh, I began designing these stools. Uh, my dad was was like a huge help because he's an engineer. He has like a lot of uh, like woodworking stuff like in his garage, in our garage. Uh, and yeah, uh, so yeah, we when designing these stools, we had like we really wanted to focus on like uh, I guess like like transportation wise to make it sort of like really easy to like stack and transport, uh, which is why they have that sort of uh, like angle to it. So you could very, so you like the, the bottom piece could very easily fit with the top. Uh, 
Yeah. And so then uh, afterward, we uh, we set up a GoFundMe page uh, in order to elicit like the correct amount of funds that we would need to acquire all the wood. Uh, I believe it was $800 total. Uh, and once we were able to collect all the funds from like family, from friends, from other members of the community, uh, we I think we we stayed in budget pretty much the entire time. There were a couple things that went slightly outside of our budget, but it wasn't like that cost effective. Um, but yeah, so then following that, we uh, I then like set up a uh, sign up sheet for other scouts and other volunteers uh, to come over to my house. Uh, as you can see in like uh, some of the photos here, uh, this was our this was our general like setup where we had these kits with each piece and uh, I would demonstrate how to put, put each piece together uh, like drilling holes, um, like actually staining each stool in order to give it like a, uh, a unique texture to it. Uh, so yeah, I think we, it was four days across two separate weekends uh, that we took to building these stools. Uh, it was it was actually it was really uh, interesting, like because uh, I wasn't too keen on like being in charge of like this sort of project before. Like I had done some leadership roles in my troop, but this was like this was wholly unique, I guess, to me at least. Um, yeah, uh, there was definitely some rough patches in the very beginning uh, with getting certain ideas across, but in the end, it, it ended up being very smooth uh, with the actual building. Great. Yeah. Terrific. They're, they're quite impressive. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, then uh, following, following this, we were able to uh, transport all the schools. It was two separate trips, but we uh, got them back to the school. Uh, we met with Mindy Shelton, as you can see in the, the bottom right there, where we have all of the stools stacked. Uh, but yeah, uh, I in the in the end, like this was this was definitely a very unique experience. Like I didn't really expect my project to like be that uh, I guess like unique to like other projects that people in my troop have done. Uh, like I didn't really expect that it would actually like like take as long as it did either, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it, it was definitely definitely an experience to say the least. Right. Well, um, thank you for your contribution to the community. Very much appreciated. Thank you. All right. All right. And I see Councilmember Rack has his hand up, and then we'll go to Councilmember Dugan. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, Nicholas. Congratulations on uh, your project and on your Eagle Scout um, as a fellow Eagle Scout. Just uh, want to offer my congratulations and hope that you continue to be engaged uh, in the community and in service. And uh, thanks for what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, someone else had their hand raised. Councilmember Dugan. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, Nick, congratulations, Nicholas. A good project, had a real impact, uh, required a lot of leadership. You're even fundraising. Uh, so a good project, but yeah, like um, uh, my colleague, Council Member Rack, just want to pause and recognize that uh, becoming an Eagle Scout takes years and years of uh, focus and dedication and, and, and extra work. And this is just the culmination of that. So uh, congratulations on all that. And uh, we're proud of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, one more person had their hand yep. raised, I believe. Yep. Council Member Collins. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to add my congratulations, Nicholas. As a, as a former scout, uh, I never made it to Eagle Scout, and I know how hard it is. So I, I really uh, appreciate your accomplishments and congratulations. Thank you so much. And Vice Mayor McDowell. I'll chime in very quickly to say congratulations, Nicholas. Thank you for your service to the community, and um, I hope you continue your leadership in, in, in our community and in our society. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Nicholas. We wish you great luck. All right.
So that takes us to our next item, which uh, we'll be hearing a brief presentation from Colleen Carvalho, Associate Director for the Bay Area Cancer Center, talking about the services that they offer the community. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I am Colleen Carvalho, the Associate Director at BACC, as we affectionately call it. Um, and I'll just briefly go through our services. I know we have a tight amount of time this evening, but feel free to contact me afterwards or our organization and we'll be happy to answer additional questions. Um, so our promise to the community is that we uh, empower people on their breast or ovarian cancer journey and equip them with personalized education, supportive communities and practical resources at no cost. And it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month right now. Um, so we appreciate you inviting us here this evening to recognize that. And we do hope that you'll keep our information in mind throughout the year for any of those who you might know who would need our services. Um, and this is just kind of reflective of our promise statement, our mission, supporting those with breast and ovarian cancer with personalized services that inform and empower. And just a few of our defining attributes that I'll briefly touch on. Um, we always place the needs of our clients first, which ties into some of our other attributes of our personalized services. So we really work with clients to figure out what it is that's most important to them, how they want to receive support. We don't just have one way that people use our services. People contact us and tell us um, a little bit about their situation. They may have heard about our services before and know exactly what they're looking for. Some want to talk through what we offer, which is ranges from support groups to health and wellness classes to a buddy program, to um, cancer information education. We really have a range of services and try to work with people to find out what's gonna be most useful to them. Uh, we do include families and caregivers in many of our services and we utilize the support of volunteers to make them happen. Um, and we do provide all of our services free of charge. And this is just a little graphic to show kind of the range of things again that we offer. Um, we offer over 50 programs individually that take place each month. And then we also have more ongoing programs and services. Um, so we really just continue to add. We're adding a financial support resource, um, which I'll mention later. We offer financial aid for certain clients, help with screening services for those who need connection with breast cancer screening services. Um, we have an annual conference coming up on November 5th, a day of different professionals in the area are coming to speak and share their information. We focus our support groups, we have counseling, um, and our support groups are actually focused on certain types of breast cancer or ovarian cancer or unique situations. So we have um, metastatic cancer support groups, we have young women's, we have a Black, Indigenous, and People of Color breast cancer support groups. So we really try to um, make our support groups even more specific which our clients tell us is um, extremely helpful. Um, and this just details a little bit more, um, some of the support groups that exist within the different categories that I mentioned. Um, but one thing I don't think I mentioned too much is our personalized medical research. So we do have staff who have their PhD in things like cancer biology. We can go over pathology reports with clients to help them better understand their diagnosis and treatment and go through NCCN guidelines. Um, we don't provide a second opinion, but we can really just help provide that education so somebody feels more empowered and more comfortable with the information they're receiving um, and better able to make decisions on their journey. Um, and mentioned our buddy program, our insurance and employment help, and our boutique, which I'll touch on in a moment more. Our outdoor boutique. Um, so right now, everything that we're offering for the most part is virtual or by phone. Our boutique is one exception to that. It's one service that we haven't really been able to transfer to Zoom. So we do have in-person appointments on our back patio. They're outdoors and socially distant. We do sanitize between appointments, but we help people find um, bras, hats, wigs, prosthetics. Sometimes we help them find swimsuits for prosthetics, but we really... Um, have realized that this is one service that is no longer as available in the community either. Stanford has actually stopped offering their wig bank. American Cancer Society has closed their Look Good, Feel Better program, which offered wigs. So um, we are happy that we're still able to provide this service. And just briefly, our Breast and Ovarian Cancer Emergency Fund is a, one of our new programs. And we help people who are newly diagnosed or um, 
within six months of their treatment to receive support for things like rent, paying their mortgage, medical bills. Um, sometimes we help with funeral expenses and other things. So that has been a, a useful program to many clients in the community. Um, and just we hope that you will check out our program calendar page on our website. I won't go into too much detail on that, but we hope you'll look at more on there. Um, and just one exciting initiative I wanted to mention before we wrap up, just that we are actually realizing with the pandemic and with traffic in the Bay Area that it is so hard for clients, especially in treatment, not feeling well, to come to us for services. We're trying to bring our services to clients, so we've actually obtained a small van that we are bringing wigs, hats, bras, prosthetics out to different communities throughout the Bay Area. Um, we have our first event in Salinas on October 30th, so we are really trying to spread out. We're going to be partnering with Zuckerberg San Francisco General to offer services there, cancer support communities. So we're trying to um, bring our services out to others, which we had started doing with the pandemic with offering groups at different locations, but now we'll actually be able to bring tangible services as well. Um, and then this is just our website. We hope you will either follow us or um, look at our website for more information and feel free to contact our helpline if you ever need any additional services. Any questions? Great. Thank you so much, Colleen. Uh, very um, innovative programming that you have to offer uh, people in the community with cancer. It's a devastating diagnosis and I uh, really appreciate uh, what you and the group are doing. Right. Do any of my colleagues have a question uh, for Ms. Carvalho, Council Member Rack. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just want to also just echo your, your comments. Um, Colleen, thank you very much for the presentation. It was really informative and helpful. And it, it's good to know these kind of services are out in the community. And, and thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Council Member Dugan. Yeah, thank you so much, Colleen. Really appreciate the overview and uh, just the wonderful work that you're doing. Uh, cancer has had major impacts on my family, and I know a lot of patients uh, can feel very alone and, and adrift in the system. And I, I see like everything you guys are doing, it's almost like you're just trying to meet the patient there with, with love and compassion. And uh, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Yes, that is so true. We try to create a different community or community for these clients. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening and uh, sharing with us more about what your program is about. And hopefully now more people in the community are aware and they can access your services if need be. Yeah, Let's hope they don't <laughs> need to. <laughs> All right. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Next item is item uh, 4C, Jessica Yang, uh, Community Foundation, San Carlos Vice President, and Michael Cam Campbell, Community Foundation of San Carlos uh, Vice President, will be um, providing an up their annual update uh, on their programming. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members, staff, and the broader San Carlos community. Thank you for the opportunity tonight. Um, my name is Michael Campbell, Vice President of the Community Foundation of San Carlos, and I'm here with Jessica Yang, President of the Foundation, to give you an all to give you all an update on our activities over the prior fiscal year, which ran from July 1 of 2020 through June 30th of 2021. So next slide. We'll we'll be talking tonight. Other direction. Mm -hmm. Oops. Jessica, I'll, I'll help from here. Okay, thank you. That's okay, I'll just keep going. Uh, tonight we'll be talking about our grant program, uh, how much money we've distributed to the dozens of local nonprofits serving our community. We'll also cover our fundraising efforts and the performance of the endowment. And finally, we'll talk about the many efforts of our board members and volunteers to build community together. And go to the next slide. So first we'll cover the financial update. The year ended June 2021 was the foundation's first full year in operations. We've continued to manage our funds with the dual goals of supporting our community today and growing our endowment to support the community's needs into the future. We're happy to report significant progress towards both of these goals. 
So let's first look at how we benefited the community today. As you can see on the right-hand side of the chart, we're able to grant out over $200,000 to 38 organizations who serve those who live, work, play, and learn in San Carlos. We did this while keeping our expenses very modest at less than $11,000. That means 95% of our spending went into the grant program. On the other side of the chart, you can see the combination of the generosity of our community and the power of the endowment. With a total of over $265,000 in gifts received, added together with $456,000 in investment returns from the endowment, we had a total of $722,000 of total income. So next slide. And so when we look at the performance for the year, we can see net assets grew almost 23% and now sit at $2.7 million, which is really amazing considering during that time, we also granted out over $500,000 in just our first two years. We're incredibly grateful for the amazing generosity of our community. We had donations come in from almost 100 new donors, including a very large gift of $100,000 from real estate developer Alexandria. To date, we really haven't put a lot of effort into our fundraising. We've rather, we focused our efforts on building community, sharing information about the success and impact of our grant program and setting up listening posts to hear from the community. We listen both online via social media and starting this past summer at live events like the farmer's market. So we wanna thank everyone who's already engaged with us in either forum. And we invite you all to talk to us either online or at our booth. We'll be at the farmer's market this coming Halloween. And again, later in the year and, and of course next year, as well as at other events, which Jessica will uh, describe in a bit. So next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, we granted out over $213,000 last year. The first two rounds, of grants in July 2020 and November 2020 went out as part of our COVID relief fund. We held our first regular grant cycle this past spring where we issued $99,000 in grants. And finally, we awarded $2,000 in grants based on the suggestions of each of the four winners of our racial justice poster contest. Jessica will talk a little bit more about that later as well. Our next grant cycle is fast approaching. Applications are due this coming Friday, October 15th by 7 p.m. Next slide. Of course, we didn't do this all on our own. We got lots of help from others. So just for one example, to celebrate Pride Month in June, Devil's Canyon Brewery hosted us, as well as representatives from Coast Pride, Safe Space, Reach and Teach, and the San Mateo County Pride Center. Each organization took the opportunity to educate the community about the services they offer, while everyone got to listen to great music and enjoy the food trucks and beverages from the brewery. So the next slide. So you guys have seen uh, me and Jessica and a few other board members in the past at meetings like this, but there are many more volunteers working behind the scenes. We recently held our elections at our annual meeting on September 22nd, and we now have 14 directors on the board with the six pictured above making up our officers and executive committee. We're really excited to welcome new board members, Madison Duran, Paige Scott Sarmiento, Will Stroll, and Chris Tran. And new this year, we're gonna have an official liaison to SCEF as uh, Paige will serve that role, and Luke Eden will be our liaison to the Youth Advisory Council two organizations we work closely with. And we had to say goodbye to some board members, but many of them continue to stay involved on our committees as grant readers, event organizers, et cetera. And so if anyone out there is interested in getting involved, uh, just drop us a line, uh, info at sancarloscf.org to get involved as a volunteer, committee member, board member, uh, however you like to be involved. And so at this point, I'd like to hand it off to our board president, Jessica Yang. Thank you, Michael. 
Um, good evening, Honorable Madam Mayor, City Council members. My name is Jessica Yang. Um, I am honored to be able to provide you an update on the activities and next steps for our Social Justice and Equity Committee. We have changed the name of the Racial Justice Committee to be more expansive with a focus on equity. The word cloud you see here was created from responses from community members who participated in the 21 day challenge in June. The words that pop here are want, better, community, and equity. And with this expressed desire, let me share our progress. Next slide. Last September, we shared a three pillar strategy for this work to transform public spaces, to curate community learning opportunities, to honor and celebrate the diversity of our community and highlight overlooked perspectives. We have delivered on all three pillars. Over the summer, the Horizon Light Mural was installed celebrating women in science with the support of over 100 community paint day volunteers. The project is inspired by the passions of two young community leaders, Danielle Villasenor and Sebastian Fuene, who are now both away for college. On the community learning front, the 21 day social and racial equity challenge held in June secured participation from the San Carlos School District, local PTAs and parent groups, city council members, the city of San Carlos, San Mateo County Office of Community Affairs, employees of the NASA Ames Research Center, and many, many, many more. At the conclusion of the challenge, we were honored to partner with Thrive Alliance to host a community conversation with a debrief led by Shireen Malakafazali, the Chief Equity Officer of San Mateo County. To honor and celebrate overlooked perspectives, we put three banners across Laurel Street. We have supported these heritage celebrations with learning resources, events, shopping and donation recommendations for Black History Month in February, the Asian American and Pacific Islander Month in May, and we are currently celebrating Latinx Heritage Month. So please check out the community portraits shared by our community members as part of AAPI Joy and for Viva Latinx. We had 13 community members who shared their heritage stories on the Viva Latinx community profile. So please do check it out. Um, as the summer, actually still back to the previous slide. Um, at the start of the summer, we also partnered with Devil's Canyon Brewing Company to host two community celebrations, AAPI Heritage Month in May and Pride in June, which Michael mentioned earlier. The owners of the brewery reported that the May celebration brought in more traffic to their venue than they had seen in the last 18 months. Not only did we bring in tra um, traffic, the three AAPI owned and operated food trucks were completely sold out before the end of the evening. So we were very happy with that turnout of our community at the start of summer, end of school, just wanting to get back together to build community together. All right, next slide, thank you. Um, in honor of International Day for Elimination of Racial Discrimination in March, we also ran a poster contest themed racial justice. Here are our age group based winners. You could click once. So this is Racial Love by Maya Olson. You can click one more time. Um, this is No More by Malia Kedorova. There is Always Light by Hannah Deliso. And Chenedu Okobi by Rosie Moriarty. The winners each directed donations of $500 to nonprofits focused on racial justice. Our plan is to make this an annual contest. I will take a moment to point out that all of the efforts of this committee so far have been funded by a single donation from a community member. Going forward, we have included support for these efforts in our operating budget. However, we will always welcome community donations. Next slide. Looking forward, well, I think maybe we'll click again. Okay. Looking forward, here's a roadmap for the remainder of 2021. You may see, yeah, you, you may have seen the Latinx Heritage Month banner across Laurel Street last week, and we have the profiles and resources currently. You click again. In November, we will be joining 50 other towns and counties in the Bay Area in the movement against bias and bullying during the fourth annual United Against Hate Week. The Community Foundation has printed out posters that will be distributed around town and can be picked up at our farmer's market booth on Halloween. On Friday, November 19th, we will be hosting a slam poetry contest at Devil's Canyon Brewery. All are welcome to participate. 
More information will be shared via social media and on our website shortly. Winners will be determined by the audience's applause, and uh, the winners will be able to direct $1,500 in donations to nonprofits of their choice working for justice and equity. You can click one more time. Today, October 11th, is Indigenous Peoples Day. We acknowledge that we are on historic homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone tribe and are committed to honor and partner with the Ramatush Ohlone people whose land and water we benefit from today. In partnership with the San Mateo County Libraries and the Association of Ramatush Ohlone, the Community Foundation will be sponsoring a webinar with the Ohlone History and Culture, um, webinar about the Ohlone History and Culture to be held Thursday, November 18th. Stay tuned for details. We can proceed to the next slide. Looking into 2022, here's a high level overview of our planned activities. Key things here to point out are two sessions of the 21 day challenge. We will be, um, we have scheduled quarterly facilitated community conversations. And scattered in here are sponsorship and support of community building events, such as Week of the Family, Hometown Days, and summer block party. You can click to the final slide. As we conclude our annual update, we want to thank our honorable mayor, vice mayor, city council members, commissioners, and the city of San Carlos for your continued support. We thank our community members and neighbors for participating in the events and activities as we build community together. I want to remind our nonprofit partners that the fall grant applications are due this week, October 15th by 7 p.m. Sorry for the typo there, but it's this week. Um, please visit our website to sign up for our newsletter and keep an eye out for our annual report coming soon. Follow us on social media, share our posts with friends and family, and please help us help our community by spreading the word of the Community Foundation of San Carlos. On behalf of the Board of Directors and volunteers of the Community Foundation, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. and. Um... Mr. Kimball, uh, any questions for, I see uh, Council Member Rack and then Council Member Collins. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, thank you, Jessica and Michael for the presentation and, and to all the board members. Uh, I just, I don't have any questions. I just wanna say congratulations on the great, very successful year. And um, clearly you're, you're finding a need and a niche in the community. And, and I look forward to you have a robust and ambitious schedule for next year. And, I look forward to continuing to support that from the community and from the city and uh, and personally. So thank you for all you're doing and uh, congratulations. Thank you, Council thank Member. you, thank you, Councilmember Collins, and then we'll go to Councilmember Dugan. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Jessica and Michael. Great presentation. Um, several years ago, uh, this idea was sort of mulling around in my mind and also uh, former council member uh, Mark Olberts. But it was really Cameron Johnson that brought it to light. He was the one that said, I think we should do this. And I'd been thinking about it, but I just hadn't, I hadn't brought it up. And I, I'm grateful to Cameron to, for uh, getting it started. I'm glad we supported it. It's succeeding beyond my wildest dreams. And I'm just really pleased to see how it is growing and developing and benefiting many, many members of our community. So thank you both again, and uh, keep up the good work. We're very proud. Thank you, Council Member Alton. Wouldn't be here without you and Cameron getting us getting us going. <laughs> Council Member Dugan. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, yeah, Jessica, Michael, thank you for the uh, the overview. And uh, yeah, what an outstanding year that the foundation can grow by that. You know, more than twenty two percent well you're having uh such an impact in the community and keeping your operational expenses uh so minimal really uh speaks to the spirit of the organization and uh just um you know uh, it, it, it's very uh much a vehicle of our community so uh just thank you for that thank you vice mayor mcdell oh sorry <laughs> vice mayor mcdell thank you madam mayor um thank you jessica and michael for being here with us tonight um, I just want to note that the Community Foundation was in the right place at the right time to immediately respond to the COVID-19 emergency, and the Foundation has done such great work supporting so many amazing nonprofits in our community that were helping people through such difficult times. 
And I know that a lot of volunteer hours went into the grant making process and um, I'm just so grateful for the strong base of volunteers serving, serving on the foundation. And I also want to recognize the foundation's um, social and racial equity work, as well as the efforts to bring the new mural downtown. Um, I truly feel like the values that we hold dear in San Carlos just shine through and are amplified by the community foundation's work. So thank you so much. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Very, very impressive body of work. I really appreciate the contributions that you're making, as well as the people who support the organization. Uh, very generous in terms of time and treasure. Uh, nice to see that we have it in San Carlos and that there's so much enthusiasm uh, for the work. So thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Okay. So uh, that brings us to... Um, Let's make sure I'm tracking here. Council uh, communications and announcements. Council communications and announcements are brief items from members of the city council regarding upcoming events in the community and correspondence that they've received. They are informal in nature and no action will be taken at this time. Uh, Vice Mayor McDowell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to let my colleagues know and perhaps you are aware already as well. Um, I received some correspondence today from a concerned community member about Sam Trans's proposal to merge bus routes um, that could potentially impact our youth getting to the youth center from Tierra Linda, Charter, and Mariposa schools. Um, and I have very strong concerns about any proposal that eliminates transportation for our youth. Um, it's my understanding that staff will be meeting with Sam Trans soon to discuss these proposals, but I do tonight just want to be clear that I'm open to sending a letter or communicating as a council if necessary to Sam Trans. Um, I'd like to see an update from staff on this meeting. Um, I think that time is of the essence because my understanding is Sam Trans votes on these routes on November 3rd. And um, I think if Sam Trans wants to come and give us a presentation, I would welcome that as well. So I just wanna make sure that that's on everyone's radar and that we um, take action if necessary. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I don't see any additional hands, so we'll move to public comment. Uh, so persons wishing to address the city council on matters not on the posted agenda may do so at this time. Each speaker will be limited to two minutes. Um, if the item you are speaking on is not listed on the agenda, please be advised that the city council may briefly respond to statements made or questions posed as allowed under the Brown Act. The city council's general policy is to refer items to staff for attention or have a matter placed on a future city council agenda for more comprehensive action or report and formal public discussion and input at that time. Uh, Crystal, are there members of the public who wish to make a uh, comment? Yes, we do have one hand raised. Karen Molinari, you should be able to unmute. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can. Great. Thank you. I am raising the issue that Council Member McDowell just raised. Definitely concerned about Sam Tran's decision to uh, truncate bus routes and merge existing school bus routes. As many of you know, um, there was a, a group of five or six of us that formed the Transportation and Safety Committee about five or six years ago through our PTA coordinating council and with work with the city council and with Sam Trans, we advocated very strongly for the return of buses to the city of San Carlos. Sam Trans currently serves school bus routes to Menlo Park, Redwood City and Belmont. And as the city that has them headquartered here, it, I felt that it was um, you know, very disappointing that we didn't have bus service in the city of San Carlos. That being said, we worked really hard. We got bus routes and we removed a ton of cars off of the road. And we're very, very excited as a community to have basically the building blocks of youth transportation um, and alternate transit experiences. And I'm very, very um, disappointed that Sam Trans is choosing to alter these bus routes. The Route 61 has been so popular. There are two full buses. They even had to test accordion buses out. So what I'm asking is for council to do the same as what Council Member McDowell asked, is to follow up with Sam Trans staff 
to work with your council representative for, for the South County, which is I believe um, council member Jeff G and make sure that this is a top priority. I feel that as a community, we will definitely go back in time and have many more cars on the road if these routes are reduced the way Cal Trans is, um, or Sam Trans is um, choosing to do so. And they only make these route changes, you know, like a couple of times a decade. So it's, uh, it's if, if, if this happens now, it will be many years and many more hard fought hours for us to get these buses back. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Council Member Rack. You're on mute, Council Member Rack. You would think after like two years of doing this, I would figure it out. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. I just want to follow up on the comments from the um, from Ms. Molinari and from the Vice Mayor. That I, I would be supportive of us of staff trying to reach out on this. I do think it's an important issue, um, and uh, I appreciate their bringing it to our attention. Council Member Collins. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd also add, I'd like to have my support as a former member of the Sam Trans Board. I I'm familiar with, somewhat familiar with uh, not only the bus routes, but how difficult it is to make changes. But I do think we need to reach out to Sam Trans and, and see how we can work with them to uh, hopefully uh, make sure that uh, our citizens are, are are well served and and so that we don't have uh, an increased traffic issues. But it is a it's a very complex issue, and it's it's going to be uh, it's not going to be an easy task. Thank you, Councilmember Dugan. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, perhaps we can revisit this in the agenda setting. But you know, I I too would like us to look at this, and you know, very concerned that such a significant change on San Carlos could happen on such you know like I don't you know I'm not sure if we've received any official notice as a city or you know how we were to find this out, and it seems like a pretty quick uh, timeline if. Uh, the final decision gets made in less than a month. So uh, not not happy about any of that. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll lend my support to uh, the initiative. So um, I'd ask uh, City Manager, Jeff, if you could follow up and figure out what appropriate next steps might be that given the timeline and the lack of council meetings between now and then. Absolutely. We'll put something at least for uh, discussion on your next agenda since it sounds like um, that might be your only opportunity. And in the meantime, uh, the staff, when we heard about this uh, just last week, has already reached out and asked for meetings with the CM Trans staff. And I think, um, you know, the comments shared by the council and the public this evening are, are very similar to the um, comments and thoughts of the staff as well. Thank you. All right. Uh, Crystal, are there any additional members of the public who wish to make comment at this time? Yes, uh, we have Sonia L. You should be able to unmute. Thank you. I just wanted to echo what the other, um, what Karen said, what the what Sarah McDowell raised, and what you all just agreed to do. I think getting our youth um, familiar with and um, you know in the habit of taking public transportation is incredibly important at this time for climate reasons for independence reasons for any number and so thank you for staff and council for following up with that thank you thank you Sonia um, and I think Karen Molinari has her hand up again Madam Mayor would you uh, sure Thank you. And I did just want to acknowledge, as Jeff mentioned, I actually really appreciate it was Stephen Machado who Machido who reached out to those of us that were on that traffic and safety committee to let us know about these plans, else we would not have known. So kudos to um, city staff for getting everybody um, involved again. And I, I really hope that we can advocate for this as a community. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. All right, Crystal, are there any additional members of the public who want to comment? No, there are no further hands. Okay, all right, thank you. So uh, with that, we'll move to the consent calendar, item seven. Are any members of the council wish to pull an item from this list? All right, seeing none, we'll take a motion. Madam, Madam Mayor, Mayor, I will. Go ahead, Ron. <laughs> I'll move to approve city council consent calendar items A through K. I'll second. 
All right, any further discussion? Any public comment? Crystal, can you call the roll? Councilmember Dugan? Yes. Councilmember Eck? Yes. Vice Mayor McDowell? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. And Mayor Parmer Lohan? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so that takes us to item 8A. Uh, we'll be receiving a presentation from Jeff Maltby, City Manager, and this is um, employee COVID-19 pay consideration of adopting a resolution authorizing and appropriating $150,586 from the general fund unassigned fund balance for a one-time employee COVID-19 emergency recognition pay. Jeff? Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, Jeff Maltby, uh, City Manager, and Crystal, I'm going to need uh, your help in forwarding the slides. So if we could uh, go to the next slide, I'd appreciate that. Um, a little over a month ago, the uh, City Council asked us to put this uh, item onto the agenda uh, after reading about um, uh, an initiative like this having been passed in the City of San Mateo. And what we're going to talk about this evening um, in terms of how this might function, uh, if the council wished to move forward with it, is, is almost verbatim of, of how things worked in the city of San Mateo. I understand um, that just recently uh, the Board of Supervisors in Santa Clara County took a similar uh, action. So I know this is continue, an issue that's continuing to be talked about by cities, um, and we're likely to see additional action along those lines. Um, Obviously, as the city manager, I, I am exceedingly proud of our city staff. And um, over my long year, my long tenure with the city um, as the city manager and in other positions before that, um, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of great employees and do a lot of you know really amazing things um, uh, in different capacities. Um, a lot of the things we did in the last couple of years, I think in one way or another, I'd seen done to a certain extent over time, uh, but never in my life had I ever seen sort of the totality of so much dramatic change happen in such a, a compressed period of time as COVID hit us. Um, the city of San Carlos was a little bit out in front of uh, the other communities, if you'll recall, uh, in the Bay Area because because we were dealing with um, our response to um, those uh, cruise ship passengers who um, who had been uh, exposed to COVID and were being quarantined at a local uh, San Carlos um, hotel that had been rent rented. And as a result of that, we, um, we activated our emergency operations center and, um, and began working with the county and the state uh, to deal with that situation here in our community. Uh, that went on for uh, uh, a couple of months, uh, and the Emergency Operations Center um, remained open and active for many months uh, as things sort of escalated and continued to evolve in uh, the city's response to COVID-19. Um, during that time, we had to close facilities, reopen facilities, close facilities again, um, dramatically change uh, our programming, cancel programming, create new programming. Um, many of our employees were moved to um, a remote work environment for, at, at that particular time, a completely unknown duration. Um, we had employees who were having to create and implement new technologies to make that all happen, while other employees were really um, working in a completely different capacity than their um, historic job duties. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more um, as we go forward. Can you see the next slide, Crystal? Thank you. One of the things that um, the city and, uh, and its staff did very early on was respond to the potential financial uncertainty that was outlined by the city's financial advisors um, that we work with uh, year in and year out. And as a result of that, we began contracting our budget very quickly uh, because the unknowns were just so vast. We wanted to make sure that we had the capacity to continue to provide the most critical uh, programming and services to our community. So city employees agreed to, to uh, partner with the city council in reducing a budget 
uh, not just in uh, the normal operating uh, costs, uh, which was part of it, but also in terms of their salary and benefits. They gave back about $400,000 um, in very short order at the beginning of the pandemic to help uh, the city create some financial certainty as it moved into a very uncertain uh, time. We eliminated a number of, uh, of vacant full-time positions, seven, uh, to help save money. Uh, the additional remaining staff, um, you know, those duties and that work didn't go away. Um, it was picked up um, by other employees who um, were also doing a lot of other sort of unusual uh, duties uh, in response to COVID at the time. Uh, while all that was happening, we still needed to do our normal day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, um, people's home projects needed to continue to be uh, processed, potholes continued to need to be filled, um, public projects and infrastructure needed to continue to be maintained and, and worked on. And we needed to continue to uh, run and conduct the business of the city. Uh, can I, can we see the next slide? Thank you. Um, as, as I said earlier, um, it was a really unprecedented, almost even unimaginable um, period of time where uh, adaptation um, to change came um, almost on an hour by hour basis some days, as opposed to you know, days or weeks or months or years uh, at a time, um, in, not just in response to what was happening in our community, but um, the directives that were coming from the federal government, uh, the state government, the county government, um, that we were working to figure out how to implement um, and regulate here in, in our community to help keep folks uh, safe and healthy and to try to get um, you know people uh, back to being able to do their, their, their jobs. As you recall, in the beginning of the pandemic, we were um, in the position of having to shut many industries and jobs down, um, which was something that we really had no process or procedure in being able to do. Um, these were the types of uh, very abnormal job duties that uh, folks were being asked to, to do. Um, projects had to be reprioritized. Um, uh, we had to work with our contractors who were um, at some time suffering COVID outbreaks on their own staff or trying to figure out their own workplace policies to be in compliance with um, the rapidly changing laws and rules that were taking place. Next slide, please. These are the types of um, uh, things that we needed to also do. We had new programs um, trying to encourage um, outdoor activities that were safe for the public. Um, that This led to uh, the closing of city blocks and the creation of uh, bicycle and pedestrian routes to give people the opportunity to, to get out and do something and not just have to shelter in place uh, in their homes, but have other activities that they could do, but also feel and know that they and their family members would be safe. Uh, the city council was one of the very first, if not the first in the Bay Area, to implement an outdoor dining program. Um, not only, and I, I, I know the council is, is well aware of all the different iterations and changes and adaptations we, that needed to be made to that program to help accommodate the impacts of uh, business owners in the area and be accessible to the public. Um, and, and we did that uh, very rapidly, but also while we were doing that, we were uh, fielding calls and helping other agencies throughout the Bay Area implement similar programs uh, in their communities because uh, word of what we were doing here in San Carlos very quickly spread to other communities. Uh, so we were involved on, a, on an even more regional um, basis uh, at the beginning of that, uh, trying to help other uh, cities understand what it was we were doing and um, how it was so successful here in our community. Uh, there were many programs um, that we put in place to help support our seniors who were very homebound uh, when a lot of their in-person program activities uh, were ended. Uh, we moved very quickly to create online programs we created very quickly to um, reestablish a modified uh, lunch program for our seniors so they could continue to be fed in the community. Um, we uh, established um, our own workplace uh, safety protocols for employees uh, because despite, um, you know, sort of the, the, the easy outside speculation because City Hall was closed and city facilities were closed, everybody was working remotely, but actually it 
on any given day, about 30% of our city staff was working in person. There were many things, um, certain computer systems that had to remain behind our firewall uh, for um, uh, the, the security of those systems and, and the protection of um, uh, uh, private public data, um, you know, people's addresses and private information that they submit to us, credit cards, all those kinds of things. Not all our systems are we can be accessed by city employees remotely. So there were city employees who had to continue to work uh, in the office. There were city employees who were taking on other job responsibilities, like being out in the field, uh, helping provide food to those who needed it, didn't have access uh, to that needed resource. Our maintenance crews continued to work. Our inspectors had to be out and um, not only doing their normal um, work, but um, inspecting um, restaurants and businesses for uh, COVID protocol compliance. Um, and, and then as um, you know, outdoor dining spaces were being built, um, uh, working to ensure that those were being built in a way that was uh, safe and uh, compliant with, with our city building codes. So that the folks in the community who use those um, could use them in a, in a safe way. Next slide, please. These are just some examples that I've already touched on, so I'll move on to the next slide. Uh, so what the city of San Mateo did was they created a program where they would do a one-time payment of uh, $2,000 in, in recognition for employee efforts during the first uh, year of the um, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in San Carlos, that means uh, that would that would equate um, after you include uh, Medicare and Social Security, um, which replied to that, it would equate to $150,000 uh, on a one-time uh, basis. Next slide, please. Uh, the active employees that would be covered um, would be employees that were employed in the city between March uh, 10th of 2020 to March 31st, 2021. That'd be 70 full-time employees. Uh, those employees would have to be uh, currently in good standing, uh, not having not having resigned from the city. There's no, um, you know, we're not. We wouldn't be sending uh, a check in the way that San Mateo did it. Uh, there's no uh, money for employees that have moved on to other jobs or have been dismissed. Um, for discipline or other reasons uh, during the course of their employment during that time period. They'd have to have a recent performance evaluation of uh, satisfactory or higher, and it would only apply to um, part-time employees who meet the uh, minimum work of 20 hours per week, which makes them eligible for CalPERS uh, uh, membership. Uh, those are the, the those are the criteria that were established in um, the city of San Mateo, and as I understand it, seem to be the types of criteria that are being uh, discussed in other agencies. Next slide, please. Uh, so to be clear, the employees that would not be covered uh, by this um, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pay provision would be uh, elected officials, uh, the city manager, uh, the city attorney, uh, any employee hired after March 31st of 2021, or any part-time employees who did not meet the CalPERS eligibility requirement. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions from council? Council Member Dugan, and yeah, then we'll go to you, Council Madam Member Rock. And uh, uh, thank you, Jeff, uh, for that overview. And uh, yeah, it was a heck of a year. And, uh, um, you know, I certainly note how fiscally responsible you and your staff uh, was in that uh, trying time. Um, my question is, you know, I come from uh, the business world where, uh, you know, uh, bonuses are a pretty typical component of compensation. Uh, but I'm used to um, bonuses being considered and, and, and thought of as a, uh, a pool that then gets allocated based upon performance. Um, so I'm just curious as, as uh, uh, the city manager with, you know, as you're thinking about a bonus pool, why would you want it evenly distributed and not reflective of particular performance or particular sacrifices uh, in the challenging year we had? Mm, absolutely. That's a good question and an interesting one. I think, um, 
you know, I think as as I look at the program and talk to the to folks who who sort of you know, pioneered this in San Mateo and, and are looking at it in other locations, I think the the thought about this particular program is that this was just an exceptional period of time uh, in every way. Doesn't really compare to anything else, um, you know. But maybe um, if you worked at Apple. Uh, in in the year leading up or the two years leading up to the iPhone invention, um, you know, maybe um, they looked at it as something so remarkable and uh, something that was, um, you know, honestly, you, you really, it wasn't a period of time where I could necessarily measure normal good performance as opposed to just being blown away by the exceptional nature of everybody's willingness to do things that they had never been asked to do before, um, to just invent solutions to a problem on the fly, um, and we do the we do that type of work in, in local government frequently. But as you're well aware, uh, council member, typically when we do that, it, it involves you know dozens of public meetings with our councils and our commission and our community. Uh, you know, to solve a problem. It doesn't usually involve figure it out today because we need this solved by tomorrow morning so you can move on to the to the next issue. And, you know, we saw that uh, across the board in, in our organization. And I think, um, you know, many other organizations experienced a, a, a very similar phenomenon with their employees. Um, you know, there, there was no pushback to it's not in my job classification. Not a single person ever said that. Um, and so I think that might be why um, this is looked at slightly differently. But in a traditional setting, if this was something that the council had an interest in, um, you know, turning into a program, I think it, it would be, it would be, uh, it would need to be accomplished on a go forward basis, more in lines of what you were talking about and what you're familiar with. And hopefully we never have to do what we did <laughs> for that year again. For sure. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Thank you. We'll go to Council Member Rack and then Vice Mayor McDowell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Jeff, thanks for the presentation. I had a couple um, just clarifying questions and then one sort of more, I guess, philosophical question around things. Um, in your slides earlier, you mentioned about the elimination of the seven full-time positions and the $400,000 in, uh, I think, salaries and benefits. So can you just, I, I just want to make sure that I have it clear and then the public is clear. So we didn't, as I recall, we didn't make any specific, those aren't specific cuts. Those are potential increases either for cost of living or other things that didn't happen for those employees. One, and are any of those seven positions been uh, rehired as things have opened up again? Yeah, those are great questions. So um, the answer to the first question is it was a combination of things. So there were some uh, benefit changes um, that were, um, you know, like real world sort of mm -hmm. reduction. Um, and then, uh, and then there was the agreement to forego the raise that they had already um negotiated with and agreed to with the city council that was just about to take place. So in that sense, it was future money, but it was not, um, it was not, you know, sort of imaginary future. It was something that had already, you know, been agreed to and was anticipated and was about to um, have to be implemented according to those agreements. Um, the answer to your second question is um, yes, the, uh, a number of those positions have been uh, filled and several others are now in the process of being uh, filled. So we are are getting back to normal. Um, our current financial projections are are definitely um, trending upwards significantly. Um, our worst case scenario and worst financial fears um, that we had um, at the beginning of 2020, as uh, we were dealing with that uncertainty, uh, have not come to fruition and. Uh, and we've got we've had you know good news on our financial front, and and there's every reason to believe that moving forward, uh, we're moving back into a period of um, financial stability uh, where there's a, a likelihood of growth in in our uh, in our revenue, and uh, 
you know, expenditures as well, but in a, in a balanced and sustainable way. Great. Thank you. If I could just quickly just ask from a philosophical standpoint, I mean, at, we had our retreat recently. You talked about some of the challenges from the staff in terms of workload, in terms of retention, other issues. And um, I guess what I'm struggling with to understand is like, does this make the, you know, how this plays into that and what kind of impact this has versus sort of looking at those longer term systemic problems that we have um, that, you know, maybe might be a better approach to, to addressing some of the challenges that you raised at the retreat? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I guess the answer to that question, you know, could be, you know, a lot of different things um, for a lot of different people, depending on your point of view. The way that I look at this in particular is is more of a special circumstance, um, you know, um, where you're you're just honoring a sort of a remarkable situation as opposed to, you know, honoring somebody for, um, you know, doing a really good job in their, their normal job. This is more of a above and beyond kind of unique moment. And, it, and it's just really hard to sort of put it in context with other things. Um, as I said, with um, council member um, Dugan's question, I think if you're, you know, there are a lot of pressures, you know, that employers are facing right now. And certainly we have those um, pressures and, and probably some others that are unique to uh, public sector employment. Um, that we're dealing with right now, I think those are going to require, you know, special and unique efforts um, for cities and, and special districts and other government entities to address. And those um, those efforts are likely going to have to be, you know, ongoing in nature, as opposed to something like this that would, you know, really, I would very much hope would be a one-time uh, thing, because I would very much hope that we don't find ourselves in the situation of having to, um, you know, rework the world. Uh, overnight again because of a horrible pandemic. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And thanks, Jeff. All right. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor McDowell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thanks, Jeff, for the presentation. Um, my question for you is um, you mentioned that the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors um, just passed something similar, staff recognition pay. And what I read about that um, in the press was that the county executive stated that the American Rescue Plan Act requires that some of the funding be used for some type of recognition pay. And I'm wondering if you or staff um, had heard about that and, and um, what we know about that. You know, it's an interesting question, um, Vice Mayor. We've been researching that. Uh, uh, we, we took a look at the same article and are talking to them about that. I don't have an answer for you tonight on whether or not it requires some of the money to be spent on that. But it is now clear to us that that it is eligible. Some of the money is eligible um, and could fund some, at least some of the hundred and fifty thousand dollars that a program such as this would cost. Uh, but we'll continue to take a look at that. Um, obviously, uh, it makes it even easier if it's if it's a requirement. Then we need to figure out a way to spend some of that money to be. Um, in in um, in compliance with the law, um, as the majority of that money is going to go to to serve the community and projects and, and services that benefit the community. Great, thank you, John. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, my questions were asked. So um, we'll I don't see any other hands, so we'll move to public comment. Crystal, are there any members of the public who wish to make comment? Yes, I do see one hand up. Mark Leach, you should be able to unmute. Mark Leach, if you can hear me, you should be able to un. There you go. Yeah, it took a few seconds to figure out how to turn that no microphone on. Sorry about that. No worries. There was a comment earlier about you'd think after two years of this, we'd know how to do this. Um, so good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Mark Leach. I'm the Teamsters 856 representative for the San Carlos workers that perform many of the tasks that our city manager just described. Um, our folks are particularly proud of their efforts to keep the city alive, um, particularly the business uh, sector down on Laurel Street, the setting up of the barriers and making it possible for restaurants to um, feed and entertain residents and keep those funds flowing through their businesses. I know that frontline workers experienced a very stressful and very different COVID period than many of us that can call ourselves Zoomers because 
we put, we did our work behind a screen. They put on masks and they were out there on the very first days. Um, their disaster service worker designation was put to the test, and I think it's well earned now. They they really understand what it means because they've all been doing it for two years, or almost two years. Um, Teamsters eight by six supports the city city manager Malpi's presentation, and we thank you for this resolution um, and look forward to it passing. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. And there are no further hands. Okay. All right. We'll move to discussion. All right, we'll go to Council Member Collins and then Council Member Rack. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think it was an excellent staff report. Um, a lot of things that I was going to say are included in the staff report, but I think trying to remember if one of them that I learned was that, you know, a lot of our employees really couldn't work from home. Um, they spent an average of 35% of their time uh, working in person on the job. Um, it, and as uh, Jeff said, you know, at the beginning, we anticipate a very large loss of uh, income to the city. And, and our, as he said, you know, they gave up, employees gave up about $400,000 in pay and benefits. And basically, they, they took a pay cut and they worked harder than they had before. So in my mind, returning less than 40% of that loss, you know, to our employees. It, it's really near neither hero pay or even a bonus. It's actually just a partial restoration of really hard-earned uh, uh, compensation. So the other thing I want to point out is that when talking with our um, administrative services director today, she indicated that because we paid down a very large portion of our uh, CalPERS uh, unfunded liability last year, we actually saved $800,000 uh, this year, and we will save that amount every year. And I would like us not to forget that this really, this recognition really is just a one-time thing. And also, this is the second time in 12 years that we've asked our employees to take pay cuts and, or cut their pay or cut their benefits. So I really don't think it's too much to ask that, you know, people, the, pe the people that take care of us they take care of us every day, they take care of the city every day, that they be recognized for that long-term commitment. I just think it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Collins. And we'll go to Council Member Rack and then Council Member Dugan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, just wanna follow up. So, um, so just from a discussion standpoint, I certainly appreciate um, all the hard work that staff has done and, and that was pointed out during this last year in the pandemic. and. Um, and certainly it's been ongoing in terms of not just during the pandemic, we have a great staff uh, who's dedicated to our community and appreciate all the work they've done. Um, what I'm struggling with here is that, you know, I don't know that this is the right process to do this. We, we, we didn't sort of follow the normal process in terms of doing this. It was brought up at a meeting, out, not really using the, the agenda setting that we had set up. Um, so I don't know if there was the same kind of transparency that happened around this. Um, and, and as I mentioned, Jeff had brought up at the retreat certain challenges that we're having in terms of retention, in terms of workload, and, and potentially in terms of overall compensation. Um, to me, I think we are better off doing this in a comprehensive manner, um, looking at this thoroughly in a, in a more transparent way. And, and and making recommendations. We used to have a subcommittee on, on employee issues. We, we don't have that right now. I, I think that that's a better approach is, you know, and if it, it means that we get back and come back and say, yes, let's do this this way, or the numbers may be different, or we should have a, um, you know, a performance-based plan. Uh, we, we do this through in some of the negotiations. Um, and if we need to do an overall review of compensation, whether to make sure we're competitive, if we need to hire more people to fill more positions to me, uh, I would prefer and think the better approach is to look back and say, let's go back, recreate this subcommittee, give them a task, spend the next 90 or 120 days and make sure they come back with some recommendations that we need to do to help support our employees in a more holistic manner to help the city run uh, and, and, and to support them. So. Um, I'm, I'm struggling with just arbitrarily saying, let's just pick $2,000 and do a bonus versus 
trying to really solve some of the challenges and support our employees uh, would I think is in a better manner. Thank you, Council Member Rock. We'll go to Council Member Dugan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And um, I, I guess I would say, you know, uh, uh, I, I hear Council Member Rack as far as, uh, you know, should we study this more or think more about it or, you know, should this be a more extended process? Uh, not opposed to that if uh, that's the majority of, of the council feels that way. In general, though, I, I think I do agree uh, with Council Member Collins that, you know, uh, I mean, it clearly was an extraordinary year. An awful lot was asked of our staff that got stretched in an awful lot of, uh, of ways. But if you take a step back, you know, a lot of people had a tough year. But what's different here? I mean, what's different here is that, um, uh, you know, they also were responding to the uncertainty of our budget and took very proactive, responsible steps very early in the pandemic to make sure um, it was going to go okay. And they did it at really in a self-sacrificing way. So um, they uh, closed down uh, seven requisitions. That's roughly 10% of, of the size of our staff, right? So, you know, they went in underhanded, uh, you know, with, without as many people to pull this ore, which was harder to, harder to row last year. And, uh, and then on top of that, they, you know, uh, set aside uh, raises that they had already negotiated for. Um, so I, I do agree with Councilman Barack. In, in many ways, this is just a partial restitution of, uh, of compensation that they very responsibly set aside. And uh, happily, we're, we're on the other side of it. Uh, the fiscal house is still in very good shape, and uh, the light is firmly at the end of the tunnel. So, uh, so in general, I, I, I do support this, uh, this modest uh, uh, bonus plan here. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Vice Mayor McDowell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think context um, on this issue is really important. So I just I wanted to make sure that I say a few things tonight. Um, so as Jeff mentioned in 2020, there was a lot of uncertainty and we were predicting very bad budget numbers due to the pandemic. And as Jeff mentioned, the council approved reductions in staff salary and benefits. And these concessions amounted to $400,000, which on average was $6,000 per employee with the median at about $3,500. And one of the concessions was that some staff salaries were kept flat instead of giving employees a typical 3.5% base wage increase as a cost of living adjustment. We also kept several positions unfilled and we laid off two employees in our parks and recreation department. Employees were asked to do more with less during the pandemic. And we can't forget that we were the first city on the peninsula to declare a state of emergency and open up a 24 hour emergency operations center. The city did not close. Some staff worked remotely, but many did not. Sewer lines were still cleaned and repaired, streets were repaved, parks maintained, playgrounds were sanitized under new protocols, home permits continued to be processed, building inspections were done when some construction sites did have COVID risk. All of that was done in person and none of those jobs were remote. Public Works completely reconfigured Laurel Street. So when anyone sits down for a lovely outdoor meal, please don't forget that many staff hours that went into working with each specific business owner in person for the parklet, dealing with the water walls, processing the permit, going through many iterations of table spacing based on changing state guidelines, figuring out and inspecting outdoor lighting and the heating and parking arrangements, this was all an enormous effort that involved both our economic development department and our public works department, working very closely with all of these business owners. Our economic development department also launched our shop local campaign, one of the first in the county that was launched. Parks and Rec expanded our services to the senior community by providing drive through lunches in person. Tremendous success in that area as well. There are many essential city functions performed by our staff that cannot be done remotely. And even those who did work remotely were also picking up new tasks on top of the everyday jobs that required that were required to keep our city running. So just because the public may not have seen all of this going on does not mean that it wasn't happening. And the fact that the city continued running and that our residents continued receiving services as normal despite a global pandemic while also successfully implementing many additional COVID-19 response programs is important to recognize. 
And while I believe that there are many people like nurses and teachers and first responders and essential workers who all deserve to be recognized, what is within our purview tonight as a city council is that we can recognize the efforts of our own employees. This recognition pay helps make up for the salary and benefits concessions that staff made in 2020, all while working harder and taking on more projects than ever in our community. But I also think that there are deeper issues that need to be tackled, like employee retention and being understaffed. San Carlos is no longer a quiet town. We have a lot of change coming, and we have heard from staff that employee turnover and lack of time to complete tasks are un underlying issues. So I would like to take a deeper dive into fixing these root issues, staffing up to a level that meets the current demand on our services. So I do also support Adam's suggestion for creating a subcommittee, um, and I'd like for um, it to report back um, on employee retention efforts and increasing our staffing to meet the needs of our community. Um, and I also want to make a note about process. Going forward, I don't think bonuses or staff incentives should be handled this way. A more appropriate time to have discussed this would have been during our budget hearings or our labor negotiations. This pay recognizes work that went above and beyond during extraordinary circumstances, and it helps make up for salary and benefit concessions in 2020. But I will not be amenable to bringing bonuses forward in this manner again. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. All right. Uh, so from my perspective, um, I, um, you know, I, I look at this um, and I appreciate the comments about, um, you know, referencing what was brought up in our mid-year retreat. Um, and I would agree that um, we would need to take a, a, a deep dive and separate look at that. And I believe that we agreed to do that in that meeting. Um, and I see this as a, a separate, um, um, a separate um, component um, that is really a one-time uh, COVID relief payment uh, that will help us um, to continue to retain the essential workers that provide the city services that our, our residents uh, have come to rely on. Um, many of our essential service uh, provider, city service providers already face challenges with our local cost of living. We talked about that extensively at the mid-year retreat, and the pandemic has, um, you know, worsened these conditions, um, the, the situation for them. And uh, I see this one-time payment as intended, intended uh, to help uh, them recover as well. Um, I also appreciate the fact that the city council and city administrators will not be receiving a supplemental payment, only workers that are essential to providing city services working more than 20 hours a week and have a satisfactory uh, evaluation. I'd like to thank um, all of our city's essential workers that continue to work hard to provide the city services that our community uh, has, co has come to depend and rely on. Um, and again, you know, the satisfaction uh, results uh, from the community with respect to services providers uh, provided uh, remains extremely high uh, as it had in pre-pandemic. And uh, to me, that just shows the extraordinary uh, work that was made. So. Uh, with that, I don't see any additional uh, hands raised. So at this point, I'd be willing to entertain a motion. Madam Mayor, I'd like to uh, move to adopt resolution 2021-99. A resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos authorizing and appropriating $150,586 from the general unassigned fund balance for a one-time employee COVID-19 emergency recognition pay COVID-19 pay. I'll second that. Okay, uh, further discussion? Madam Mayor, I just wanted to follow up on something that um, you mentioned, and I think Council Member Rack and Dugan and I kind of had agreement on. Is it your impression that from our strategic retreat that we will be discussing staff retention and um, staffing up in a separate forum, um, because I, I noted Council Member Rock's idea of a subcommittee, or maybe Jeff would like to weigh in on how we address the second part of, I think, what three of us at least thought was a good idea. So, Jeff, could you address that? Absolutely. I'm happy to, um, to share with you where we're at with that. After um, our discussion at the um, uh, the mini retreat about those topics. Uh, we had a discussion at the staff level where, where I shared um, how the discussion went and council thoughts and some of the requests that you made about how that might move forward. 
uh, staff's kind of working on putting some bones together right now. And uh, I was anticipating that, um, that one of the first uh, duties of our new mayor every year is to uh, work on new subcommittees and new subcommittee assignments and that we would create that subcommittee with our new mayor and uh, kick it off as one of our uh, first initiatives of 2022. Councilmember Rapp. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, I thank you, Vice Member Dahl, for the, raising that again, and, and Jeff for that, that um, uh, response. So uh, I appreciate all the, I just want to say, I, I am not going to support this tonight. I'm going to, um, I, I think that we are better off doing a more holistic look at this versus a one-off bonus. I'd like to really support our employees. I don't think this does accomplishes what needs to happen. Um, and so I will not be uh, supporting this. My sense is it's going to pass and, and I appreciate that. And, and I do want to reiterate the, I do think our, we have fantastic employees who stepped up and did a lot, but um, I just don't think this is the right approach to, to um, support them, address some of the long-term issues we're having and, uh, and just wanted to, to share that. Thank you. Thank you. Crystal, can you call the roll? Um, oh, I, see. I have one more. I still have a follow-up question, Madam Mayor. Um, Jeff, why wouldn't we establish the subcommittee now? And, and kind of get the ball rolling. Uh, I, we certainly could. I, I can just add a uh, subcommittee creation to your next agenda if you'd like to uh, to do that. Um, and then we'll begin scheduling meetings with whoever you appoint to the subcommittee uh, just as soon as we have something to, to uh, get rolling on, which uh, I'm sure we can start having our, our first discussions as early as uh, November. Could we do that as a motion now? Um, Greg, well, Greg yeah. can you weigh in on this? Yeah, no, I was, I've just, um, I, I, we've, we've historically um, given the council the ability to, you know, delegate, um, you know, to, to set up subcommittees, you know, to, to refer matters for study at a meeting without agendizing it. But I, I just want to caution the council that we've set up um, this protocol that we want to try to follow where we, where we have the initial discussion uh, of agenda set whether or not we want to set something on the agenda and then and then we the stack gives the staff the opportunity to to study it a little more and then it also provides this um, compliance with what I'm calling a safe harbor that allows you to have a, a more substantive discussion of the idea even though you have it's not really up for approval yet just whether or not to consider it um it, it's it's not required legally. I mean, you're you're able to, to do that tonight, but I just I'm just cautioning the council that you might want to go in that direction and uh, and just bring it up to at the next meeting for us to um, put it on that agenda setting item. Thank you, Greg. Councilmember Dugan. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. I was just going to share that. Um, yeah, I mean, this, you know, we're coming out of this pandemic. We're still dealing with work at home issues. Uh, I think uh, a lot of employees have uh, experienced a jarring year. A lot of us, all of us have in many ways. So, yeah, this is going to be a year I think all managers and all organizations are going to have to be especially mindful of uh, of, of all retention issues across the board. So um, I know, Jeff, you're well aware of that fact and, and the rest of the management inside of our staff, I'm sure is as well. So I, I wholeheartedly support a subcommittee if uh, that's at all uh, helpful to this process. Yeah, I would agree. I think the timing of it just, um, I know we've talked also about the fact that staff have a lot going on. <laughs> so, you know. Um, I'm in support of it too. That sounds great. We'll we'll place an item on your next agenda so that you can uh, formally create the subcommittee and um, select your appointments from the five of you. Thank you, Crystal. Can you please call the roll? Councilmember Rack. Present. What, Vice Mayor McDowell. Yes. Councilmember Collins. Yes. Councilmember Dugan. Yes. And Mayor Parmalaya. Yes. Okay, so with that, uh, we'll move to item 8B, consideration of introducing an ordinance repealing San Carlos Municipal Code Chapter 
8.27, prohibition on the use of polystyrene-based disposable food serviceware by food vendors, and adopting a new chapter, 8.27, disposable food serviceware, regulating the use of disposable food serviceware by food facilities. And giving the presentation this evening will be Adam Lokar, a management analyst and sustainability specialist. Welcome, Adam. Great, thank you. Um, good evening. Uh, members of the City Council. I'm Adam Lokar, uh, Management Analyst in the City Manager's Office. I'm here today to give you a presentation on uh, the Disposable Food Serviceware Ordinance um, before you for a possible introduction this evening. Next slide, please. Uh, this ordinance aims to reduce the distribution of uh, plastic disposable food foodware, which is a, a major contributor to, to street litter and can end up polluting our creeks and the bay. Uh, plastics in the ocean can break down into microplastics that end up in our food and have negative health impacts. And certain plastics, particularly those uh, number three through seven, are, are increasingly challenging to recycle. Um, in response to these issues, the, the City Council has identified limiting the distribution of, of single-use plastics as a strategy in the uh, newly adopted Climate Mitigation and Adaptation Plan uh, and objective in the, the 2021 Strategic Plan. Also, in an effort to address this issue, the, the County uh, of San Mateo Board of Supervisors adopted a model ordinance last year that aims to eliminate the unnecessary distribution uh, and use of disposable food serviceware that's not reusable or compostable, uh, improve the health and safety of the community, and help keep waterways and beaches clean. So the, the City Council had reviewed this model ordinance during a, a study session at the August 23rd Council meeting and directed staff to conduct outreach to food facilities uh, to gather feedback and return uh, for possible ordinance introduction, which is what we're here to do this evening. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just to review the, the provisions of this ordinance, it applies to uh, food service providers, which is any entity that provides prepared food for consumption. So this is uh, restaurants, grocery stores, cafes, uh, festivals, farmers markets, uh, but also private schools uh, and healthcare facilities are uh, included. Uh, next slide. Uh, the ordinance then requires uh, certain disposable foodware uh, distributed by these food facilities be non-plastic and fiber-based uh, compostable, meaning that they are derived from materials such as uh, paper, sugar cane, weed stock, bamboo, or wood, and they must be certified by a third-party entity. Um, so this requirement applies specifically to plates, bowls, cups, clamshells, trays, and other containers. And also these four um, small accessories, uh, straws, stirs, utensils, and toothpicks. Uh, for items not listed here, the most notable being lids, uh, they, they're still allowed to be plastic as long as they are uh, recyclable or compostable by the food facilities collection service. Um, in, addition, in addition, all other uh, small foodware accessories such as cup sleeves, uh, napkins, and condiment packets must only be available upon request by the customer, upon acceptance, uh, or at a self-service area. So it should be noted that just last week, uh, Governor Newsom signed AB 1276 into law that includes many of the same restrictions around the distribution of the foodware accessories. Uh, we're working with the county to make sure that we are, are consistent with this new state legislation. Next. Here are uh, the exceptions to the ordinance. Uh, the first exception just clarifies that this ordinance only applies to prepared food and, and not pre-packaged food. That's anything that's sealed uh, or has an expiration date. The second exception uh, allows customers with medical needs to request a plastic straw. At the same time, um, healthcare facilities uh, can distribute plastic straws without asking. Uh, drive through areas may distribute straws and cup sleeves without request, and foodware made up entirely of aluminum foil is exempt. And finally, the county will be considering hardship exceptions on a case by case basis if there's a um, specific foodware item that does not have a, a readily available uh, compostable alternative, that item can be temporarily exempt, and the county is keeping a list of these on their website. Um, and the county will also consider uh, financial hardships if the uh, additional cost to purchase uh, suitable foodware is deemed to cause a significant economic hardship, then a food facility can submit a request for an exemption. Um, so following council's direction from the, the August 23rd council meeting, uh, staff reached out to all 154 food providers, encouraging them to fill out a survey to gauge the feasibility of complying with the ordinance requirements. Uh, we received 27 responses uh, with some of the most common uh, concerns listed here. Uh, most were concerned about the cost, uh, availability and, and durability of compostable foodware, 
Uh, we received a lot of just clarifying questions related to specific food wear items. Um, council had also requested us to ask about the feasibility of trans transitioning to reusable food wear. And we heard mostly about uh, public health concerns and other sanitation concerns related to reusables. Um, there's also a preference for an incentives uh, approach to encourage a transition. And when asked, a majority um, of food providers uh, indicated that their existing foodware inventory would last somewhere between six months to one year. Uh, in passing the model ordinance, the county has offered to support other uh, jurisdictions that adopt the same model ordinance without changes. Uh, and that support includes uh, education and outreach services to food providers and the broader public. Uh, the county has hired a company called uh, Environmental Innovations. They'll be reaching out directly to all food facilities to make sure that they are uh, aware of the ordinance requirements and offer direct technical support to help alleviate some of the concerns shown uh, in the previous slide. Uh, the county team will be sending mailers, uh, hosting workshops, uh, developing a resource guide, uh, keeping a list of, of acceptable products on the county website, and, and also targeting the broader public um, through print, uh, radio, and digital ads with a, an example on the slide here. Um, the county is also offering to provide enforcement services for jurisdictions that adopt the same ordinance, and to take advantage of the enforcement services, the city would have to enter uh, into an MOU with the county. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there are nine other jurisdictions in our county that have adopted the same model ordinance uh, shown here, along with their ordinance effective date. Um, as you can see, most cities have chosen to align their effective date with the county starting in March uh, 2022. Um, uh, we are also recommending that council move forward with the March uh, 25th, 2022 effective date to promote uh, consistency uh, across uh, the jurisdictions in our county. Uh, next slide, please. And pending um, ordinance introduction this evening, uh, staff can return at the, the next council meeting for adoption and approval of the MOU with the county. Uh, we can also begin uh, coordinating with the county to ensure its services are fully taken advantage of uh, while also conducting outreach through our own communication channels. Slide, and uh, that concludes my presentation. I'm, I'm joined this evening by Unsu Lim, the Senior Sustainability Specialist with the County Office of Sustainability, and we're both available to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I see we have uh, Councilmember Rack has a question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And Adam, thanks for the presentation and for all the work um, on this. Um, the, the one question I had is, I, I know you mentioned that we have to stay aligned with the county in terms of um, getting sort of support from enforcement, education, and everything else. Does that include the the start date? I, I know you've recommended the 25th of March. I noticed, though, in the some of the feedback from the that you did receive from the outreach from the food service providers is that um, access to certain compostable materials was, they believe, challenging. And I, I know we sort of have this issue of sort of the global supply chain right now with the pandemic and things. And so I'm just wondering if, you know, we want to try to be a little more flexible on that to maybe push the date out, um, given some of those potential challenges around that. Yeah, so the um, great question, the the, we do not have to be, we do not have to be consistent with the county's enforcement date to receive their education uh, outreach uh, enforcement services. We can, we can do a different um, date. I think from, from staff's perspective, kind of trying to maintain the consistency is the, is the main um, rationale behind our recommendation. Um, and to your, to your point about the, the access to, to finding food where the, the, the availability, that's one of the key uh, services that the county's team is gonna be helping provide is actually connecting food facilities with vendors uh, of allowable products so that they, they can get that access easier. Great, thank you for that, appreciate it. Thank you, we'll go to Vice Mayor McDowell and then Council Member Dugan. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Adam, for the presentation. Um, I really appreciated all the information in the staff packet and also going out to the local business owners for their feedback. I think that was um, very helpful. Um, I, my question for you is on the exemptions and um, if you have a little more information on how they work, because I note um, in, in um, one of the areas of the staff report, it looks like it's actually the city manager who decides grounds for an exemption. 
um, and that the city determines a reasonably feasible disposable food service where um, that it does not exist. So it sounds like there's some um, that the city takes ownership of that in providing those exemptions. I noticed that there were a few business owners who spoke up in the survey about um, needing special containers for the bantini cakes or for um, hot ready foods that they didn't feel that the compostable containers currently serve. So um, do you have a little more information about that and how maybe we can streamline that process of exemptions for, for certain requests from our local business owners? Certainly, yeah. So the uh, the it does reference the city um, in that section, but we we're as part of adopting this model ordinance, we would it also um, authorizes the county to enforce um, those provisions of the ordinance, including determining who what what foodware items are um, exempt. So that would be the county manager or their designee, which is the, the office of the county office of sustainability. So the county office of sustainability will be will be looking at 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 applications uh, for exemptions from, from food facilities. If there is a specific item like a, a tray for a Buntini, um, I think that's probably a good a good candidate for as a possible exception. If there isn't a uh, readily available um, compostable alternative, they'll also be considering the applications for um, financial hardship exemptions. Um, I don't know, um, Sue, if you had any other anything else you wanted to add to that um, as you'll be kind of more involved in that process. Sure. Um, there are two categories of exemptions. One is an automatic exemption because uh, the county, based on our research that we have done already, we understand that there already exists some items that do not exist. Um, and so we want to go ahead and do the research ahead of time. Um, and so we call them like temporary exemptions. Um, and we have them listed on our website. And typical items include, for instance, like rotisserie chicken that you would find at Safeway or Whole Foods. It's, it's going to be really hard to find a fiber-based replacement for that um, until uh, the market improves, technology improves. So we have identified a short list of those items that we are going to automatically exempt from the get-go until things change. Um, and then that there's another group of exemptions. It's, re it's really going to be based on um, the operations and the characteristics of the food facility. Um, if they have a special financial hardship um, at, based on the information that we've shared with them, based on research that they've conducted, based on consultation that we have provided uh, through our consultant team, they still cannot find a compliant item that meets their needs then they can submit uh, an, an application for exemption to the county. And so we'll be reviewing it. Um, and we also ask for other uh, documents as well, including previous year's uh, tax information to ensure that you know what, what we're considering financial incentives, it fits our parameter um, of, what, of our definition. So we do have a, a, a process that we are trying to finalize right now to determine the process for exemption and how to evaluate it. Okay, thank you. So um, I appreciate those answers. I would encourage then some edits to be done to the resolution to remove the references to the city manager and to the city making those exemptions because I think that's very confusing. Um, and I did look at the county's website and I appreciated the tables of um, you know, food where um, providers that, you know, we could get in touch with. The exemptions currently, I think there's only maybe five or six. And I'm very sensitive to not wanting to bury our um, small businesses and paperwork. So I think that as you think about the process for asking for an exemption, that it be streamlined and easy. And I think, you know, Adam, if you have input into that process, you know, as the in between, between our small businesses and the county, um, I, I'm really sensitive to the fact that we, we need to make that um, easy and not, not too burdensome. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Dugan. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, I appreciate the overview of this program, generally supportive. Um, and I, I especially like the firm partnership with the county and, and having this a fairly unified 
uh, program for all of our neighboring cities, et cetera. So um, I do like the general approach here. Um, and I had some specific questions because we did pretty thorough outreach to uh, our restaurants and heard back from uh, many of them. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and they basically had some questions like specifics on, you know, is there something that can handle this or that? And so that all speaks to this exemption list uh, you were just mentioning. And so, like, how proactive is San Mateo being, San Mateo County being on making sure that list of exemptions is complete and, you know, that it's a rational program out of the gate? Because it looks like, you know, the recommendation is we all line up on this one date. You know, I, I think I would be more comfortable if, you know, it was kind of, you know, not all on one date, because I think we're going to learn an awful lot in the first couple months of this thing. Um, so I, I guess that's my question. How, how thorough is this exemption list and, and how tested is that in, in the real world with actual restaurants verifying they can order everything they need otherwise? Great. And Unsu, I may uh, defer to you on this one as well. Sure. Uh, that is a great point. And um, to be frank, it is, I would say it is not 100% um, because there are many, many items um, that are being, many food, disposable foodware items that are being used by food facilities. So when we do um, the research that we have completed so far is mainly around items that are very commonly used by food facilities. But we do understand that there are some food facilities that are specialty food facilities and they have very particular needs and their packaging is very unique. So because of that, I cannot say with 100% confidence that that automatic exemption list will be 100% uh, comprehensive because it will not be. Um, so, but we do do our best to put on that automatic exemption list um, those uh, com the most commonly used items that we have come to understand that are being used by food facilities. Um, but if there are items that are, that food facilities are using that are not listed, then, you know, we encourage them to reach out to us and then we match them with our consultant team to make sure that the consultant team is doing and helping supporting, researching existing, you know, compliant items that may um, meet the needs of that food facility. And if there aren't any on the market, then they could uh, submit an exemption application, which we will view. And uh, and if it makes sense, you know, grant them an exemption for a temporary period. I hope that answers. Thank you. Um, the, uh, and then, so just to be clear, who's lined up so far on March? Is that, so unincorporated San Mateo County is definitely lined up on March. And do you have the quick list of which other cities are already lined up to launch March in 2022? Yeah, Crystal, I don't know if you could um, go back a few slides. There okay, so, and, and those are fully approved, like, like the yeah. council's already completely signed off on that in those cities. That's correct. And, and I do want to point out too, the Half Moon Bay did begin enforcing in July of this year. So some of those temporary exemptions are built on, on that city's uh, enforcement experience so far as well. Got it. Okay, thank you. So just I just have a quick question. So if, if let's say, and I don't know what the will of the council is, but if, if there was an interest in moving towards the March um, 2022 compliance date, and recognizing that there are some uh, businesses in our community that have these specialty packaging items. Um, how does how does the timing associ work associated with trying to determine an alternative and working with your consultants? So is there enough lead time between now and then to accommodate uh, this number of cities and businesses? Um, could you talk a little bit about how that how that works and if there is there an extension granted if the consulting team you know, has too much volume of work. Yeah, I know that, yeah, and Sue, I may defer to you on this one as well. Absolutely. That is a uh, great question. So we do provide a lot of flexibility. So that enforcement start date is, and we're not planning to go start writing tickets right away on that date. 
that is really a date that we're trying to push for because we need some kind of date to aim for in the future. Um, and our purpose isn't to penalize our food facilities whatsoever. Our purpose is to really front load a lot of education and outreach to the food, to the food facilities and really help them transition to compliance. And if we find that on that enforcement date, whatever, you know, if the council chooses to adopt, whether it's March or October of next year, if a food facility cannot meet that deadline, that is okay because we are going to continue to work with them to um, help them get come into compliance. But if you find out that on that date, I mean, it's not, a, we're not planning to give out tickets on that date. Um, I hope that answers your question. And to, um, we started, we're planning, um, so working with the consultant team, we started front loading and planning outreach prior to the enforcement start date. So the process that we've started um, doing with this, uh, our city partners is as soon as they adopt, we work with them to send out a mailer, which uh, alerts the food facilities about what the city has done. The city adopted this ordinance. Um, they're going to be working with the county. Here are the consultants they are going to be reaching out to you. In the meantime, if you want to get ahead of the game, visit our website, reach out to the consultants. So that's, that's the post adoption mailer. And two to three months before the start of the enforcement start date, we send out another mailer that provides even more details on the available resources to the food facilities, including workshops that we're going to be we are going to be presenting, as well as all the available resources that we have on our website, including a resource guide or, or a purchasing guide that details out all the different types of compliant items that the food facilities can take advantage of, as well as financial incentives if they want to switch, go beyond and switch to reusables. So, um, and then as soon as that mailer is sent out two to three months before the enforcement start date, our consultant team actually picks up the phone literally and starts calling each of the food facilities one by one. And that's the process that we have started take, uh, We started doing. We did it in half one day. We have a lot of great uh, best practices and processes that we're uh, hoping to fine tune. We're going to get a second chance to do it with the group of nine jurisdictions who are going to be starting in March. And then we're going to get another chance to do it in the October timeframe of next year. Um, so each time the county we do it, we're hoping to fine tune it and make it better and better. So we have a um, a structure, uh, a strategy in place to reach out to touch the food facilities on multiple occasions. All right, thank you very much. All right, I'm not seeing any additional questions from council. So Crystal, are there any members of the public who wish to make comment? Yes, we do have one hand raised. Uh, Sonia, you should be able to unmute. Thank you, city staff. Thank you, Adam Lokar, for taking this um, action. And I strongly support what our city staff has presented and going to um, compostable containers whenever possible and would love to see um, lists of businesses that we can support who are making these changes and recognizing that we can do without our fancy things sometimes if it means, um, you know, decreasing the waste down the line. And those are my comments. Thank you. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. And there are no further hands. Okay. All right. Any uh, further discussion or comments? Uh, Council Member Dugan. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, yeah, like I said, I think this is a tremendous program. I think, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, can have a real impact on our, uh, um, uh, you know, we, we just passed our climate uh, mitigation plan. Uh, this is one of our uh, uh, action items. It's a kind of low hanging fruit in the sense that uh, the county is doing all the all the heavy lifting and um, um, so I'm, I'm very supportive of the program in general. Uh, it does concern me that I, I do think the implementation is going to be a bit rough out of the gate. Uh, you know, as, as we've heard this evening, the uh, exemption list is not final, it's evolving. And, and in my experience, uh, that's not, it's going to take, you know, it's going to take the actual launch 
and several months before that exemption list uh, comes comes close to uh, what's going to be needed in reality. Uh, so very supportive of the program, uh, but I would like to propose that we take advantage of our neighboring cities who are going to launch into this and try out that exemption list and 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 work through all those initial issues. And I would propose uh, we adopt this six months later uh, in September of 22. Um, I just, you know, I'm not sure I see the benefit of uh, being right on on the front edge of this. And I also, you know, uh, March is going to come around quickly. Uh, a lot of our restaurants are still uh, in recovery mode. Uh, this will be viewed as, you know, a significant change. So I think an extra six months uh, is a uh, good thing to do by way of our restaurants, but I also think it's a good thing to do because uh, I think there'll be a lot of noise and turbulence in March when this thing just launches, and I would like to take advantage of that and uh, step into this program when it's a bit more mature. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor McDowell, and then we'll go to Council Member Collins. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I wanted to build on John's comments. Um, I, too, support sustainability efforts in San Carlos, and I think this is an important part of our climate mitigation and adaptation plan. So um, I'm looking forward to cooperating with the county on this program. Um, however, you know, our local businesses are still really struggling to emerge from the pandemic. And as John noted, March is going to be here before we know it. And um, in the survey, 65% of respondents said that their current inventory of foodware would last six months to more than one year. And so I think it's important to give them time to both go through their inventory as well as stock up on new inventory. And if you're launching this program in March, you need to start placing your orders and getting shipments, um, you know, November, December timeframe. And Adam mentioned this earlier with the holiday shipping and all of the delays with, um, you know, international shipping right now and even national shipping. I think that that's um, not great timing, and that's that's going to be a really hard thing for our businesses to pull off to, to start in March. So I support John's um, suggestion of launching in September, or if it's important to align with another city, we could join San Mateo in October. Um, but I would like to give our businesses a little bit more of a runway to um, use up their inventory and also, you know, stock up on what they need going forward. I think that's the most fair thing to do. Um, but I would like to launch the education and outreach um, as soon as possible. I think that the education component is really crucial here um, to really get out the word about all the great resources that the county has, putting businesses in touch with the distributors, and just starting to make those connections now so that everyone can plan ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Collins, and then we'll go to Councilmember Rapp. Uh Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just... Uh, Couple questions for Adam and either either or uh, Yun Yun Su Lin. Sorry, if I botched the, your pronunciation. One is uh, tell tell us again, please, how long this uh, has been uh, under consideration? How long it's been being worked on? Uh, the, the county office, um, county board of supervisors adopted this ordinance uh, in 2020 uh, pre COVID. Um, so early, early 2020, different world. Um, and, and so, and put off their enforcement date due to COVID to, to 2022. Okay. And, and in your outreach to the businesses, has there, uh, uh, forgive me if I missed it, but has there been feedback that suggests that they would have a really difficult time um, conforming with this by March? Would they be scrambling? Um, we we did not hear any comments uh, directly related to the to the March uh, timeline. No. All right. And I see obviously that the enforcement doesn't begin till a, a year from now. Correct. Uh, in, no enforcement will begin in March uh, 25th, 2022. All right. It just says uh, San. Oh, I'm sorry. City of San Mateo begins enforcement in October right. 2022. Okay. So that's right. Uh, in your mind, how realistic will it be that uh, that you know you're going to have enforcement teams out March, April, May, or you guys, you know, what sort of grace period will there be? If, if, I mean, it, 
over the next coming months, the, the county and, and their team and uh, in coordination with all these these cities um, who are adopting in March are really going to be pushing out, as as Unsu was, was mentioning earlier, a really robust outreach campaign mm -hmm. to make sure everyone's ready to go um, for March. Um, and, and as Unsu had mentioned, this is, you know, I don't, I don't think anyone's going to be out there writing tickets uh, in March. And, and, and certainly, I think, the, as the county has stated many times, that the, the goal of the, the method of their enforcement is not to penalize restaurants, but to provide uh, education, technical support uh, to ensure compliance. And I'm sure there, that will be you know, in full display when this uh, 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 first kicks off, uh, when it, whenever that enforcement date is. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councilmember Rack, uh, you're on mute again, sir. Thank you. I'm trying to rush through things too much. Um, all right, thanks again for the work on this. I certainly um, support this. I think this is a, a great step forward, and it, again, it aligns with our climate mitigation action plan. And uh, appreciate all the work on this. I certainly, um, but I, I would agree with. Uh, Councilmember Dugan and Vice Mayor McDowell about the date. I am concerned about uh, going for the March implementation and certainly be supportive of what John suggested September or just to align with San Mateo in October and just sort of, you know, um, um, either way is, is fine. I guess the one, I, I just want to make sure that we're not sort of, you know, giving runway for uh, businesses to then buy another six to eight months or a year of supplies that are plastic to run through that, you know, if we're going to push it out, we are going to start enforcing in October or September, whenever the case may be, because I think it's fair to give them more runway, but I also don't want to, um, but I do think we need to get this in place. So certainly happy to support uh, some modifications on the date and uh, looking forward to supporting this. Right, thank you. Um, so I'm I'm in support of this um, ordinance, and I appreciate um, the council discussion and questions and staff um, uh, research on this. Um, it, you know, it's not lost on me that our landfill is filling up. I had a an opportunity to sit through a couple of our um, meetings with uh, Re Recology and um, learned that you know we have a, a small footprint. Um, that being said, I also recognize that. Um, this waste also finds its way into our rivers and streams and, um, uh, and you know, moving towards more compostable um, items uh, is, I think, an appropriate um, action to take, especially as it aligns with our climate mitigation action plan that we recently adopted. Um, to that end, um, I recognize that the, um, you know, these um, replacement or kind of new um, type foodware products are going to take some getting used to and, and because of their very nature they can degrade and their shelf life obviously is not as long uh, so i'm hopeful and i would agree with vice mayor mcdowell that we begin that education process sooner than later uh, so that uh, manage so inventories can be managed um, in addition um, i also um, uh, would also, you know, like for their conversations to begin sooner than later as well with respect to those specialty packaging items. Um, I recognize that part of a, a sometimes a company's brand is their packaging, right? It helps tell the story about what they are, and moving to the this new mode um, could have, you know, very different impact on how their product is presented and perceived by their customers. So I really think it's important that we think that through um, as a community and, and, and that the county, if they're willing to do so, work uh, with our uh, businesses, um, you know, in a, in a timely manner to provide appropriate lead times for them to convert over to compostable packaging. Um, I would agree that uh, timing of um, next year, later in the year, around October, I've heard that several times, Councilmember Dugan, so if you're willing, maybe we align with, um, I see a head nod there, with the October 22nd date um, and, and help these businesses, you know, move through their inventory. I think that would also allow for us to um, give a little bit more time for the supply chain to work itself out because uh, the last image from Long Beach showed a lot of ships um, hanging out offshore. So I don't know exactly where these products are made, but um, that, that continues to be a troublesome issue for our businesses. So, all right, I don't see any further um, uh, hands raised. So uh, Crystal, or I will take a motion at this time. Yeah. I'm sorry, Adam, it looks like it looks like uh, Adam has another comment. Adam Lockhart? One, yeah, I just want to clarify that uh, San Mateo's uh, enforcement date is, is October 1st, 2022. 
Thank you. Okay. Council Member um, Dugan. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Madam Mayor, I move to introduce ordinance number 1573. 1573, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos repealing San Carlos Municipal Code Chapter 8.27, prohibition on the use of polystyrene based disposable food service ware by food vendors and adopting a new Chapter 8.27, disposable food service ware regulating the use of disposable food service ware by food facilities effective October 1st, 2022. Second. All right. Crystal, could you please call the roll? Oh, I'm sorry. Mayor, sorry. I, have, I, I have a clarifying question. I had mentioned that I would like that amended to remove the references to the city manager being in charge of exemptions. Is that something we need to put in the motion as well? An amendment to the Ma language? Madam Mayor, I, I have an answer. I think that might answer the question. Uh, these ordinances are designed to be have a lot of flexibility. And so if you might note that the provisions regarding enforcement talk about the city manager or designee and also the, the second, there's another paragraph that gives the county the uh, ability to enforce. So I think the compromise here is to, um, you know, at some point in the future, the city might want to take control over um, the process and have the city manager actually make the decisions. But I think in practice, since the county is going to be enforcing it, the county, the city manager is basically going to delegate those decisions to the county official. And that's how it's going to work. So it, it, I think it's probably a good idea to keep the city manager in there just for our own municipal control, but it does have the ability to let the county actually run the program. Does that satisfy your requirement, Vice Mayor? I suppose. I mean, I don't know how a lay person would understand that given the language, but um, uh, I understand that, you know, things could change in the future. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? All right. Crystal, can you call the roll, please? Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Rack? Yes. Councilmember Dugan? Yes. Vice Mayor McDowell? Yes. And Mayor Parma Lohan? Yes. Okay, so that brings us to item uh, 8C. Um, Madam Mayor, I think I emailed you. I, I need to step away for a little bit for a family obligation. If I get back in time, I will certainly rejoin the meeting. But um, okay. thank you. All right, thank you, Councilmember Rack. Um, all right, so item 8C, New Business uh, Youth Center, um, uh, consideration of adopting a resolution authorizing the city manager in partnership with Peninsula Clean Energy to deploy a solar photovoltaic system at the San Carlos Youth Center. Um, we uh, will be hearing a presentation from Steven Machida, Public Works Director, and he's joined by Rafael Reyes and David Freibush from Peninsula Clean Energy. Welcome, Steven. Good evening, Madam Mayor and City Council members, Steven Machida, Public Works Director. So earlier this year, staff was contacted by Peninsula Clean Energy or PCE to determine if there, we had any interest in installing a solar system on one of our city buildings, namely the San Carlos Youth Center. So PCE is here tonight to kind of present the findings. Um, we have Mr. Rafael Reyes, the Director of Energy Programs from, for uh, Peninsula Clean Energy, as well as David Freibosch, the Technical Consultant. So I'd like to return the turn the presentation over to Mr. Reyes. Um, and But Crystal, could you advance your slide deck? Yes, I'll be helping with that. Okay, and then so Rafael, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Parmer Lohan and members of the council. Thank you for your time this evening. Again, my name is Rafael Reyes, Director of Energy Programs for Peninsula Clean Energy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, most of you, I, I believe, are, are familiar with Peninsula Clean Energy. We're the primary energy service provider for San Mateo County. Uh, with the mission of reducing greenhouse gases and providing um, sustainable and affordable energy solutions um, through the uh, energy that we provide. Uh, businesses and residents in San Mateo County are saving over $18 million a year uh, through the lower cost power that we provide. And we do a number of programs to advance uh, climate action and sustainability, and this is one of them. Next slide. 
Uh, I won't go through all of the bullet points here, but our objective here is to create a um, joint procurement process across uh, local uh, government agencies across San Mateo County, lower the transaction um, costs of uh, putting in place solar and optionally storage systems um, throughout the, the uh, sites identified by local governments. We will be talking about one specific site, but the overall program will apply, apply to future sites that the city of San Carlos may identify for similar systems as well. Uh, we have been working closely with a leading technology um, engineering firm, um, McCalmont Engineering, that's been assisting uh, with uh, all of the site assessments, including the site um, discussed here. Next slide. Um, there are a number of innovations that we're bringing um, to this process. Um, the first is, um, is the overall site development process where, as I noted for this site, we engage McCalmont Engineering to do all the site evaluation, um, uh, to uh, essentially create a bid package. We are looking to handle the procurement process, which would offload the work that otherwise um, uh, San Carlos staff would need to do, and we would manage the installation process. Uh, in addition to that, we are also offering as part of this uh, program that um, uh, cities uh, can contract directly with uh, power uh, purchase agreements with Peninsula Clean Energy, which would allow the city to uh, have these systems installed with no upfront cost. Uh, and I'll talk through uh, some of the details in, in terms of the financials here in a moment. Next slide. Um, there are two tracks, if you will, to, to this program. Um, there's a site level track where we have done site visits, assess the sites to develop a uh, plan for the site. We've also worked through details with your staff and developed the final plan. Um, so that process is complete here for this site. And we're now operating on a programmatic level to secure um, uh, commitments from uh, the prospective participating uh, cities and county to then bring all those agencies together to uh, then do an aggregate procurement and thereby hopefully getting improved overall um, uh, equipment and installation costs by bringing all these sites together into a larger package uh, for a competitive process and ultimate installation. Next slide. Uh, so the site in question um, that we've been working on with your staff is the San Carlos Youth Center is identified here. Um, uh, what uh, we're proposing is a solar system of uh, just under 30 kilowatts, uh, which would cover uh, a little over a third of the usage on the site uh, based on 2019 utilization of the site. We have explored um, battery system uh, but uh, the site is not opt optimal uh, for a battery system given the uh, relatively high load and low um, solar potential on the site, on the roofs of the site. Um, and so we're not recommending a battery system uh, at this time. However, the system would be installed to be battery ready should the uh, city decide at a later date um, that they would like to have a battery installed. Next slide. Uh, we've also done detailed analysis, uh, economic analysis, so the potential uh, of assistance looking at the rate scale, uh, or rate schedule, excuse me, the prospective yield um, of uh, the system, and uh, uh, what the economics uh, might be. Again, we don't have final numbers, and we will have them after we get the bids in from the aggregate procurement. Um, the direct savings of the project on a first year basis are uh, modest. However, there would be no, as I mentioned earlier, no upfront costs. And if one looks over the 20 year cycle of, uh, of the solar panels, um, then they um, uh, are more significant. Uh, next slide. So here we modeled um, what the net present value is over the um, uh, full term, although, you know, in many cases, solar panels may um, continue to provide power beyond a 20-year estimate. Um, 
One of the benefits of the solar panels is also regular um, uh, consistency or, or a hedge, if you will, against increasing utility bills. Um, we are expecting utility rates to rise um, over time. At this point, PG&E is seeking uh, utility bill increases or rate increases of an expected 5% uh, per year, and it could be more depending on um, the wildfire determination of, of the costs of wildfire mitigation. Um, we have included here in the model a 1% uh, um, escalation in the power purchase agreement. We actually anticipate that won't be needed, in which case the numbers would in fact be better than what we've modeled here. Um, but uh, in the interest of being conservative, um, we did put that in here. Again, we don't normally, um, we don't currently have any power purchase uh, uh, arrangements with any escalator. Um, but in this um, conservative model, uh, the city would save uh, over $100,000 uh, from a net present value standpoint over the 20-year term uh, of the uh, project. Next slide. Uh, as we, I noted earlier, we are presenting at um, all the local agencies uh, that uh, have opted in to participate uh, in this project. Uh, in fact, the Hillsborough City Council is uh, uh, right now <laughs> speaking, also uh, meeting on or considering this item. And the City of Brisbane has already approved as of last week participation in, uh, in the aggregate procurement. Uh, so we do expect, uh, based on staff interest and initial feedback, that uh, most or hopefully all of the agencies will participate. Next slide. Uh, so with that, so I'd like to turn it back over to um, to uh, San Carlos staff uh, for any closing items uh, on this agenda item. So Madam Mayor, uh, really this concludes the presentation um, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you or the council may have. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Good advice, Mayor McDowell and then uh, Council Member Dugan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thanks for the presentation and for bringing this forward. Um, I'm wondering, Stephen, if you can give a little insight into why the youth center was chosen as opposed to maybe the library or another city facility. Um, I'm a little disappointed that we can't put a battery back up um, as part of this project. Um, so just wondering if you can shed a little light on that, please. So uh, when staff really kind of looked at um, the three buildings, we looked at the ACC um, as well as the library and, and the youth center. What our, I think our original intent was to kind of use the both solar and battery bat, or solar and battery system, you know, at the youth center uh, as a as a possibility of having because the library could be used as like a shelter. So the hope was to actually kind of utilize both the solar and battery system, um, you know, as kind of a backup power supply uh, instead of a, a standing, um, you know, diesel generator. But as a result of kind of the location and how the solar panels were going to be situated, um, and then the size of the battery that would be required, um, it really did not make sense to actually move forward with both the solar and battery uh, backup. Um, but as Rafael had indicated, you know, we, we kind of got, um, we brought one, got one building that they would allow us to look at, and, and so we, we actually selected, um, you know, the view center. But one of the benefits that I see with actually putting on the youth center is, you know, this, uh, the youth, uh, you know, they're, they're very interested in, um, uh, you know, the solar, um, solar activity. And so actually having it there is also, we also have the ability to use it as a, perhaps a, a learning tool for them as well as they kind of grow and mature into more adults and kind of see the actual solar panels on, on the facility that they actually utilize. And one note, if I if I may, um, when we began the assessment, we did not know, it wasn't obvious that this would not be a strong opportunity for a battery system. Um, that really only came out subsequent to the analysis. Uh, but um, uh, uh, as I noted, there may be future opportunities uh, to add batteries as battery costs decline. It may be uh, uh, more uh, favorable. And secondly, um, we are seeing this as a, a program that we would re uh, repeat 
uh, and there will be additional opportunities to add other projects uh, in future rounds. Good to know, thank you. Council Member Dugan. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, yeah, I had the same question about why youth center. So just kind of a quick one. Um, you know, uh, obviously the no upfront cost is appealing to anybody, but I'm always concerned that, you know, we're not entering into a forever lease of our rooftops. Uh, what is the long-term ownership? Like after 20 years, do we take ownership of the system as a city or at what point can we, you know, go in a different direction, you know, and, and 20 years, 30 years, like how does this play out over, over time? Yeah, so that is an option. Um, so if that's uh, something that the city is interested in, we can um, certainly work that into the specific agreement. Um, so um, uh, uh, yes, and we haven't uh, gotten feedback from all of the agencies with regards to whether that will be of interest, but we can certainly explore that. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Any, I see Councilmember Collins. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And thank you for the presentation, uh, Raphael and Stephen. Um, one question I have is how adaptable is this system as technology changes and improvements happen and efficiency uh, and productivity uh, develop? Because as everyone knows, you know, the solar industry and solar technology is advancing it seems at warp speed. So I, I'm just wondering, um, uh, does this become obsolete in a few years? And if it if it is, how, how do we uh, how do we upgrade it over the course of time? And is that is there any um, consideration of the cost of that, or is it something that um, it's not really a question of the panels themselves, but the but the the, the technology mm -hmm. and the machinery that it that it feeds into? Sure. So um, there isn't an exact um, answer to that question, but it is an important question. So, uh, you know, today most um, solar systems are amortized over that 20 year life. And then if the system degradation is such that it becomes um, optimal to replace it, that would certainly be an opportunity. Um, so that's number one. Uh, number two is most of these are typically installed with micro inverters, which are basically very small inverters that are you know, attached or near the arrays themselves. And so swapping those out with new inverters as part of an overall swap with the panels would not be unusual. Um, there has been some tapering in the efficiency gains in solar panels in recent years, although there are some alternate uh, you know, panel uh, 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 technologies that are on the periphery that have been discussed with you know several percentage points higher um, and so if those come online and uh, you know the economics look good certainly there's nothing to prevent consideration of replacing the panels ahead of their normal um, normal useful life and that's partly would be an economic analysis as um, as that becomes available and uh, potentially something that we could explore, you know, within the PPA, I'd have to discuss that with the team and we'd have to discuss the implications with, with your staff, but, um, but we, could, we could take a look at such a thing. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I also am a little bit disappointed that we don't have a, you know, a battery backup option, but uh, again, I would assume that the technology there is also advancing. Oh, uh, yes. I, quite rapidly. And is it possible that maybe in a year or two, uh, we'll discover that a backup system would you know, makes uh, total sense and that we would do that? Uh, it's certainly possible. There are a couple of major competing influences on battery prices today. Um, certainly the scaling of manufacturer is causing um, a downward price pressure, but electric vehicles and large scale deployments are causing up upward pressure. So it's a little difficult to prognosticate, um, but there are alternate, you know, non lithium ion technologies that are also in the wings. Uh, and as I noted, the intention here is to design it to be battery ready so that um, when uh, the right time comes, right technology and costs and so forth, it could be uh, more readily deployed. Thank you. And then for, for Stephen, am I mistaken or did we put solar panels on City Hall years ago? 
No, we, we did not. We did put uh, the only facility that we do have is at the corporation yard and it's on the warehouse corporation. and in the garage. garages. Okay. All right. And so if this works out, um, is that something that we may want to uh, explore expanding to City Hall That's, and to the library, for that, example? That That is certainly a possibility. Um, you know, I, I think this is kind of one of the first steps. Uh, council yeah. may also be, um, may recall that, you know, we're also planning uh, for solar panels at uh, fire station number 16 as well. Right, right, right. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. This is all good. All right. Thank you. All right. I'm not seeing any additional um, uh, hands from uh, council. So could we move to public comment? Uh, I don't see any hands from the public. Okay. All right. Um, any further discussion? Councilmember Dugan. Yeah, Madam Mayor. Just one final quick question of following on uh, Councilmember Collins. Um, so, as you know, good program. Uh, it's being financed elsewhere, so it's easy for us to say yes. Um, but uh, when can we do this again through uh, Peninsula Clean Energy? <laughs> is you know, is this? Uh, uh, are you guys gearing up to kind of help us put solar panels everywhere? Well, that's very much the intention. Uh, this is uh, this is really a pilot phase for the program. Uh, it's a little bit, frankly, unclear how quickly the execution um, will go, uh, but we are hoping to move pretty quickly on the RFP. Um, uh, there's uh, there are supply chain issues right now with regards to equipment and installation, so I, I'm hesitant to give you a prognostication on exact timing of that. Um, our hope, though, would be that next year, in the latter, latter part of next year, we would uh, start a second round, and then every subsequent round should actually be able to execute more quickly. In fact, maybe even some pieces in parallel to each other, so we can move much faster. Terrific. Thank you. All right, thank you. And Crystal, no, no public comment. I'm checking that one. No, no hands at this time. Okay. All right. Um, we'll go to discussion. Councilmember Duke. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, good program. You know, uh, I wish we could have had a battery backup. It sounds like it's uh, being installed battery backup ready. So, you know, we'll, maybe the technology will catch up sooner rather than later. But that actually makes kind of my, my fundamental point here. So I'm supportive. I'd like to approve this tonight um, if, if we're all in agreement. But I would like to stipulate that at no point as a city we ever like uh, seed ownership of our roof for more than 20 years. I think we should end up owning this equipment and certainly have control over our roof again after 20 years. So if there is much better technology, we're not asking for someone else's permission for the upgrade or dealing with anything that, hey, 20 years has gone by, we've more than paid for the gear. Uh, we either own it or you know we can upgrade it as we like uh, thereafter. So I do feel strongly about that because um, you know, believe it or not, 20 years goes by and then it might still be up there and it might be obsolete. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Vice Mayor McDowell. Thank you. I'll, I'll just um, chime in to John's comments. I, I would support um, his idea, um, but I'm, I'm really excited to move forward with this. And I, I take Stephen's point about putting it on the youth center and taking this opportunity to really get our youth involved. Um, I think that's just a wonderful um, joining of, of two important um, sustainability and youth in our community and joining those two together is just fantastic. So great idea. All right, thank you. All right, um, and then from my perspective, I just wanna you know, thank um, Raphael and Peninsula Clean Energy for you know bringing yet another innovative program to the community. I know this move to electric and clean energy is a key uh, priority uh, to help us reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And um, uh, this is a very um, 
you know, uh, effective and interesting way to go about it uh, that enlists the participation of many stakeholder groups. So um, I'm um, also uh, very excited about it. Um, I sat in on the subcommittee and um, also made the same comment about the, the backup battery, but glad to see that it will be um, backup ready or battery ready. Um, and uh, when the time comes, hopefully we can get that, uh, get that installed. So with that, um, I guess we could move to uh, a motion. Madam Mayor, I move to adopt resolution 2021-100. A resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos authorizing the City Manager in partnership with Peninsula Clean Energy to deploy a solar photovoltaic system at the San Carlos Youth Center. I'll second. All right, uh, Crystal, can you call the roll? Uh, Madam, Madam Mayor, Mayor. I, yes. I guess I would like to add the stipulation that uh, the program runs for no more than 20 years, if uh, my colleagues would be amenable to that. Uh, that that's fine with me. Any objection? Uh, I, I would just like to know um, what the implications of that are, anything we haven't thought of. Uh, things, something that we ought to consider. I, I'm a little hesitant to add things like that without knowing, uh, you know, all the implications of it. Do you have any insight for us, uh, Stephen or Raphael? Or Greg? <laughs> the, the, one comment I would, the one comment I would make is, um, is that within the power purchase agreement, um, all of the uh, maintenance and repair would be included. Obviously, if the city assumes ownership, then that would become a responsibility of the city. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, but there's no question that sometimes ownership can can be um, uh, effective and valuable. Um, so there would probably it would probably merit a, a, some discussion with staff. We're, we're, we would certainly welcome it if the city uh, wishes to go in that direction. Um, and uh, 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 it, there might be some value in a little bit of discussion on that just so that it's fully understood on the part of all parties. I guess I'm comfortable delegating that uh, to, to staff. I mean, Jeff, is that is that effective that, uh, you know, I think we do have a consensus that we don't want our roofs given away forever. Um, you know, is that is it important that we make that part of the resolution or should is that better left as just a simple delegation? Um, I'm good either way. I think we have more flexibility if it's left out of the resolution. Um, I think the, um, you know, the direction of the council is clear on that issue. So we'll certainly uh, look to uh, um, put together an agreement that um, would honor that uh, direction um, up to the point of it, you know, maybe not, not working and causing the project to not happen. Um, you know, and if there are any, you know, major obstacles that we feel like kind of go beyond uh, the scope of what we've talked about tonight, we'd simply come back to you and, and have another conversation. Okay. I'm comfortable with it being a delegation then, sure. Great. All right. Thank you. So, Crystal, can you uh, call the roll? Okay. Vice Mayor McDowell? Yes. Councilmember Dugan? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Rack is still absent, and Mayor Parma Lohan. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, at this point, I'd like to suggest we take a, a ten-minute break. Sounds okay. good. All right. Thank you. We'll Thank be back you. at nine forty. Nine fund balance for fiscal year 2021 to 2022 to implement an off-site parking plan to address local traffic issues impacting the community from the Eucalyptus Hall Avenue holiday celebration. And presenting uh, this evening is Stephen Machida, Public Works Director. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you, Madam Mayor and City Council members. So, Crystal, can you forward the next slide? So at the uh, September 13th meeting, the City Council actually took action, approved uh, action to address the various impacts affecting the community, uh, uh, you know, for the upcoming holiday se season. Um, 
And uh, as part of that action, it really kind of focused on a lot of the area around Eucalyptus Avenue, mainly, um, you know, some additional traffic control, some additional police enforcement, et cetera. But at the meeting, council also directed staff to really evaluate, investigate parking alternatives uh, to encourage visitors to park away from this neighborhood and still be able to walk to the holiday celebration. So as such, staff did kind of an inventory and since there are really no city facilities nearby, what we really came down to is evaluate the parking lots at St. Charles Catholic Church, Britain Acres, and Arroyo Elementary Schools, as well as Central Middle School. So next slide, please. So based on the number of spaces available in the proximity of uh, St. Uh, St. Charles Catholic Church and Britain Acres, the, the walkability of these lots to you to Euclid Avenue is relatively short. Well, but we also wanted to look at the daily effort to set up the parking lot and close down the parking lot as well as servicing the lots. Really, so staff really focused on these two lots, the St. Charles, St. Charles Catholic Church, as well as the playground area in Britain Acres. Between these two facilities, there are approximately about 200 plus parking spaces. Um, staff also evaluated the parking lot at a Royal School and we anticipate, we anticipate there are about 30 spaces available. And we would use this lot as really a kind of an overflow lot. Uh, we also evaluate Central Middle School, but, uh, the parking lot at Central Middle School, but we're really not recommending this at, as it lacks really internal traffic circulation and the number of parking spaces is very limited. So next slide, please. So here's a table of what we estimate the number of spaces available. So at St. Charles Catholic Church, there are four on-site parking sites of which approximately 150 spaces. Britain, excuse me, Britain Acres Elementary, uh, the existing playground area, not, not necessarily the faculty parking lot, there are approximately 50 spaces. Oriel Elementary, uh, the existing parking lot, 30 spaces. And as I mentioned, Central Middle School, the existing parking lot, about 25 spaces. So within um, the four, excuse me, the three schools and the uh, St. Charles Catholic Church, we have about 255 spaces available. Next slide, please. So this picture kind of uh, depicts kind of where we see the parking um, would be available. So uh, um, in the kind of the foreground, this is St. Charles Catholic Church. So as you can see, um, we have two of the red pointers. There's like three lower um, parking parking areas. And between the, the three parking areas, we, get, we could probably get about between 80 to 100 spaces. And we'll, we'll essentially have to mark out those spaces as we get more into detail of the planning. And then at the very top, right off the Tamarack, there's probably another playground area that could be used for about 60 spaces. Going across the street at Britain Acres Elementary, there are approximately 50 spaces in the playground um, as highlighted in the uh, uh, red area. Uh, with that, um, we would also include restrooms at both facilities or both at both the school as well as uh, St. Charles Catholic Church. Next slide, please. So here, uh, this photo really depicts the two schools, Central Middle School as well as Arroyo, Arroyo in the foreground. So basically, we, again, we were thinking of using Arroyo as kind of the overflow. It has you know, fairly decent circulation. You have the entry driveway and exit driveway and about 13 mark, excuse me, 30 mark um, spaces. Whereas on the Central Middle School at the very top, Although you still have an entry and exit driveways, basically it's it's kind of one way in, one way out uh, on on uh, the central uh, middle school parking lot, and we didn't really feel that that circulation pattern really provided the best benefit uh, for the number of spaces available. Next slide, please. So we met with both uh, the representative from the St. Charles Catholic Church as well as the school district, and pretty much our site conditions um, were, were pretty much the same. Um, as you can see in these, these bullet points. Um, I highlighted uh, three of bullet points in yellow, and I just kind of want to talk to you a little bit, a little bit more about that. But basically, um, uh, both the church as well as the school district really felt very strongly about having these, these uh, requirements. But for the first yellow bullet point, basically the second bullet point, is the Catholic Church had requested that uh, their lot would not be available uh, during Christmas Eve. That's when they would hold their service and uh, that would be for the entire day. So that would not be available uh, should we use or wish to use their uh, uh, their parking lots. Um, and then the last two yellow 
be able to pull at points manually, turn on and off the parking lot lights at the St. Charles Catholic Church. So one thing, as we were talking to Father Dave Giorso, um, he indicated there are parking lights in their parking areas. However, they're all done by manual uh, by manual switches, so they're not on timers. And all the switches are actually indoors. So um, essentially, you would have to have a key, you know, to access uh, the building and turn on and off the, the lights. In which case, what we really felt that that's something that we really couldn't provide or allow you know, one of our consultants to do. That would uh, really be required or a city staff member would need to do that. And additionally, what they also request is that staff be available to open, close, and lock up all the parking facilities. So, for instance, if it had a gate, uh, they want to make sure that the parking lots are, uh, are closed uh, so that there's no trespassing during the times that um, either the church or school or city is using these parking lots. So these are the, you know, the two things that you know, we would need to make, uh, make sure that we comply with. Uh, and these are some of the rules that they're going to ask us to comply with. Next slide, please. So this photo actually kind of depicts uh, what I envision um, if, in fact, council wishes to uh, uh, focus on utilizing the parking lot, basically at Britain Acres as well as St. Charles and Arroyo. This is kind of the route that uh, we would depict um, getting uh, visitors to these, these two parking lots. Um, so I, I listed Britain Avenue, and I know Britain Avenue is, is this the area that we were trying to kind of redirect some of the, the the traffic away from, but um, undoubtedly we really believe that um, you know Britain Avenue will, will continue to um, see traffic to want to go to um, uh, Eucalyptus or to, and see the holidays holidays plays. Um, but for the most part, what we will try to do is actually direct um, the traffic to San Carlos Avenue, uh, then make a left turn onto uh, Alameda de las Bolas, another left onto Alma. And on the right to Tamarack and take Tamarack all the way down to until they get either get to enter the Britain Acres parking lot or the St. Charles Catholic Church on Bell. Um, for Arroyo, uh, there's several opportunities that could either take Arroyo or on San Carlos and make the necessary turns. Now, this really only depicts kind of the major thoroughfares that we can identify. As you can see, um, since these are all local streets, there are probably numerous ways that you could get to. Um, either the parking lots or, for that matter, even you go up this uh, holiday lights. Unlike um, like a sporting stadium or uh, another facility where basically the parking attendants generally can control where you, people enter and exit, um, you know, parking facilities. Here, it's a little bit different because it's a local street. Uh, we really can't control um, a lot of the streets because we it, it's a public street and people are allowed to um, traverse on, on public streets. So the best thing we could do is, is via signage, whether they're electronic signboards or stationary signs, and try to post um, uh, the kind of the direction that we would like to like them to go. Whether they follow in that direction, that's sometimes a little bit of a challenge. So next slide, please. So staff actually created two parking scenarios. The first parking scenario one basically looks at a seven-day a week um, where the parking lots are being utilized. So it would start on December 1st and go through uh, December 26th. Basically, it's a kind of a uniform parking um, that remains in place throughout, throughout most of December. Um, because it's operated seven days a week, it's gonna be the most expensive scenario and it will impact neighborhoods essentially near the lot. So of the, cost estimates that we did, uh, we looked at uh, making sure that, you know, the security staff is on, in place, parking attendants are available, portable restrooms are available, delivered, removed, as well as serviced, uh, trash pickup and removed is done daily, uh, portable lighting and generators will be needed for, um, you know, after, after it sunsets. And then we would need to some additional traffic control barricades and then wayfinding signs that we needed to either direct traffic to these parking lots or direct the pedestrians to um, Eucalyptus Avenue. And then staff overtime that is going to be needed. So basically for the parking scenario one, this is again seven day a week, starting from December 1st to um, December 26th, it's just under uh, $65,000. 
Next slide, please. So parking scenario two, that would just look kind of at the weekends, basically Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. So this would start on December 3rd and run every Friday through Sunday through December 19th, and then three days up to Christmas. Uh, this parking scenario really kind of matches uh, when the sheriff office will be present, uh, will be present, and this would be when they were mainly, um, you know, close to Euclid Avenue, kind of directing or evaluating some of the traffic. Uh, obviously, because we're only um, working three days a week, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, it's going to be the least expensive uh, scenario. Uh, kind of the downside is when the lots are not open, so these are like Monday through Thursday. Um, you know, the neighbor, the neighborhood may experience more traffic congestion, as they may always have. And then visitors, if they come more than once, and they do come on, let's say, on a Friday, and they know the parking lot's available, but then they come again, you know, two weeks later on a Wednesday, and that parking lot may not be open. And so they will be a little bit confused. Again, using the same uh, cost criteria, we estimated for a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, um, the cost would just be a little over 40 $40,000. Next slide, please. So the analysis. So, you know, when we really looked at the parking scenario, we really felt by itself, uh, the parking scenario is really it's not going to solve, solve, completely solve the problem or reduce traffic congestion in the neighborhood. Really, and we really feel with even with the combined effort of the other council approved measures that uh, you have taken, um, we still need the kind of potential cooperation of the residents of Eucalyptus Avenue. Um, and we still believe that there still be, will be some impacts. Uh, Eucla have, excuse me, the Eucalyptus Avenue residents were sent letters requesting their assistance um, to limit the days and times of their uh, light displays. Um, and then the residents, um, as a result of this meeting, we wanted to because we knew we were going to kind of redirect some of the traffic that would normally be on Britain towards uh, San Carlos Avenue, we wanted to actually inform the residents bounded by San Carlos Avenue, Laurel Street, Howard, and Alameda de las Bovas with letters kind of informing them that, you know, council uh, is considering making a parking, uh, evaluating parking uh, scenarios that could affect their streets and neighborhood um, at, at tonight's meeting. Next slide, please. So these are really, this come, kind of com concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to get, answer any questions that you may have. Great, thank you, Stephen. All right, any questions from council? Vice Mayor McDowell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Stephen, for that presentation. Um, I appreciate the creativity and, and all of staff's work in, in figuring this out. And I especially want to say thank you to the school district in St. Charles for working with the city to come up with these proposals tonight. Um, Stephen, I had a question for you on slide eight, um, which is the map with the kind of the alternate routes to get to the parking lots. I feel like this is a double-edged sword where we want to give people navigation hints to try and spread out the traffic, but then if we advertise this map too widely, then you know we might double the amount of people that come. What what is your thinking on on how to um, how to publicize or not publicize this map? Um, well, certainly this is a challenge, um, but you know certainly what what I would envision is we would want to put some, as I mentioned, some stationary signs as well as some change in the message boards um, that we had identified. So for, for instance, on Britain Avenue, I think at the prior meeting, I'd indicated, you know, we wouldn't specifically go into the specifics, but we would probably want to direct some of the traffic that be prepared for, you know, traffic flights on Britain use alternate routes. But uh, at least for on San Carlos Avenue, if we are, if we are really trying to get them to, um, you know, the parking lots, I would probably be a little bit more specific where we might have, um, you know, some some uh, changeable message boards or electronic message boards, as well as stationary signs that kind of points the vehicles to a certain direction, um, whether it's going down to San Carlos or to Alma, and then to onto Tamarack. Um, you know, these would more likely be um, stationary signs, so they'd be put on like posts, whether they're light light standards or some other posts that we might have in the in the neighborhood. Um, but to your point is, you know, 
if the intent is really to, to have to have them go or have the visitors go to the parking lot, we have to be able to kind of direct them somehow. Um, otherwise, I, I think they'll, they'll just, if they can't find the parking lots easily, they would just continue to kind of navigate or circle the neighborhoods and try to find empty space um, on the street. And, and that still may happen anyway, even if we do have these parking lots available. Great. It's a tricky issue. No, we'll have to do a lot more thinking. Um, and maybe A-frames, we could put up A-frames on eucalyptus so that people who visit eucalyptus several times during the holiday season, they can see the map the first time they walk down there. And then maybe the second time they would, you know, be better informed about where to park the second time. So um, thank you. I appreciate your, your feedback on that. Councilmember Rack. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Stephen, thanks for the presentation again for all the work uh, in, in putting this together. And again, I, I would echo the Vice Mayor's comments that the thanks to the school district and the St. Charles for being willing to, to cooperate in this uh, opportunity. Um, can you tell me, so I, um, in looking at this, I guess the question is, so if you've got people coming down, if the map were to go further, as, as I'm looking at to the right, right on Laurel, would you anticipate kind of just trying to direct some people off Britain to Royal or St. Carlos Avenue from there? Yeah, I, I think really the, our thought was, you know, we would want to really try to divert traffic away from Britain. So if we could, you know, use other alternate streets, you know, that, that's what we were thinking. So that's what we really felt for Royal is, is you know, a, a possibility. However, sure. you know, one of the concerns of the Royal as you you know, probably council is all aware, a lot of our streets are very narrow. And so, you know, that, that's always the challenge is, you know, you're, you're going to actually increase some of the traffic on some some of these very, very narrow streets. Um, and, and so that that's kind of the balance that we would have, actually have to, to, to uh, play out. So, but we really felt because, you know, Royal School, if that were truly the overflow lot, you know, actually that that could be the starting point. But, you know, if in fact they, they were coming from Laurel, um, you know, uh, you know, there, there's, as I mentioned, there's probably various ways they could get, you know, from Laurel to, to you to see either by, by vehicle or by uh, walk. Okay. Um, and then the, the second question I have is you, you mentioned that you don't, uh, I guess I struggle with this a little bit because you mentioned that you don't think putting parking at all is going to have any impact. Um, I, I actually, I mean, I guess I would disagree. I, I think, personally, I think that adding the parking piece would be more impactful than some of the, potentially some of the other measures we did, um, we passed earlier and, and appropriated some funds for. So I'd just like to understand why, and I guess it's, it's complicated, why you don't think this will have any impact, potentially. Well, you know, maybe not the right answer. Question, yeah, but. and 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 certainly, I, and I think this is something that you know my staff actually had to stew on because it it is something that, um, you know, is is very challenging. Um, but if if the main goal was to actually reduce a lot of the, the traffic congestion on Britain, and and you know what we heard is on Britain and as as well as some of the local streets, um, you know, how do you direct them to go to a different alternate route. And so, you know, if, if you were maybe perhaps a, a, a local um, San Carlos resident who kind of knew the streets, you know, you would probably take the shortest and easiest route. But one of the concerns I have is by redirecting some of the traffic on Britain and they, they're going to San Carlos Avenue, let's say, or for that matter, they're, they're using Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. um, would, would we be directing more of the traffic elsewhere on Britain. So sure, Britain is, is kind of feeling fewer cars and maybe less congestion, but now we're perhaps increasing the congestion on other streets that perhaps never received the same level of vehicles, vehicle trips on, on those streets. Um, and so that that is one of the concerns I have by, by putting them, let's say um, um, visitors from out of the city on San Carlos Avenue, they may not know the, the best direct route, so they follow it, but that also means that we're probably adding a lot more traffic on San Carlos Avenue. Uh, we may overwhelm the signal at Alameda and, and um, uh, San Carlos, 
and then making that left turn onto Alma and again Tamarack, it, it you know it, it can be very challenging. You know the alternate is you take them down Cordilleras, a little bit wider street. However, again it's the same problem we're impacting a lot of the local residents on on those streets as well. Sure. Okay, um, and then just my last question is, is there with how you sort of imagine the cost structure and the, the potentially for sort of any kind of contracting, I know there's sort of two different options. Um, is there flexibility around the, the dates, uh, I guess, given that, you know, maybe things don't really ramp up till the week of the, the second week in December, right? Maybe we don't need to institute certain things and uh, start doing parking till December 6th or something or 7th. Uh, is there flexibility around that? And, and I guess this as a quick follow-up, maybe if we end up, you know, supporting this sort of, I'd love to get a, a post-mortem for us to look at, like when when the traffic really starts to ramp up in, in terms of the overall program. So maybe we can adjust next year on, on all the things we've looked at. So, I mean, to answer your question, you know, we really did try to talk to our vendors and see what, what we could explore. And... <clears throat> You know, basically, we kind of gave them the criteria. We really felt that, you know, probably the the best price that we could get is um, at, at the fewest number of days would be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, starting from December 3rd to the 26th. I, I think if we go fewer days or fewer weeks, I think it would be harder and harder to get the parking attendants, um, the security guards on site. You know, porta potties generally, you know, th those you just order them and you know, service them accordingly. But I, I think just generally the, the security and the parking attendance, that, that would be a challenge to get. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, I've been toying with, with my staff, if in fact council wishes to um, utilize the parking and um, offsite parking, and we do um, uh, use some alternate streets other than Britain, you know, actually we, we could put some of the traffic counters in, and really kind of get a little bit more data uh, specifically on, you know, day and time. And then we could kind of monitor that. I mean, there's some other programs that we could look at as well um, to really kind of make that determination of where the cars are going. Okay, but, that, that's super helpful, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Dugan. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, Stephen, thank you uh, for, you know, this is a lot of work to try to uh, piece this together, and it's uh, not a normal problem set uh, for public work, so I uh, appreciate that. And I definitely appreciate the uh, uh, willingness of uh, St. Charles and our school district to uh, lean in and, and help out as a community. I guess, you know, kind of my lingering question is, can you please characterize, like, um, so you notified Eucalyptus, you know, I, I, I believe you've had a lot of conversation, like, where are we at as far as Eucalyptus kind of meeting us on this in any kind of collective, organized, responsible way? Um, well, that, that, that's a good question. To, to my knowledge, I mean, I haven't really spoken to um, the Eucalyptus residents for, for a while. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the letter that was sent to the residents specifically um, I don't believe they really responded back where we, we did ask them for some of their kind of cooperation where they do either reduce the days or the time uh, or the length of their holiday displays. We really haven't heard back from them. You know, perhaps they're, they're in the audience tonight, um, you know, and perhaps they would share that, but um, we, we hadn't heard. And so, you know, I, I think from my previous conversations that I had with them, they pretty much said that, you know, all they're doing is they're just decorating their, their houses. And so, um, yeah. you know, it, it, so I, you know, I'm not hundred percent sure where Sonia lives, but, uh, uh, there are no other people that might be from eucalyptus on this call, uh, this evening at the moment, unless they're on peninsula television, but, uh, uh um, the, uh, uh, I, I guess, um, so do we have any ability to kind of have an ordinance around when the lights can be on or what days of the week or how late into the evening, or is this just a public, you know, a, a property right? You can have holiday lights on all night if you want to, and you can, you know, decorate the trees in your yard if you want to. I mean, I, I get that. Is that, do we, do we have any, is there any ordinance or any way we can put bounds on this thing? I think I'll answer that with 
I, I looked at that um, and there's a case in Texas where this uh, city had to settle with a property owner over a light display, uh, which gave me a little um, pause to think about time limitations. But generally, uh, I mean, there may be a way to constitutionally provide for the time limitation on um, holiday displays, but I think it's definitely expressive conduct and it would be very difficult to do that. Okay, thanks. I'm just, uh, you know, it, it is hard for us to totally bend over backwards as a city without a partnership here. So, you know, I, I, you know, I, I love this holiday display. I go buy it every year, but um, it is kind of hard for us to navigate this in a bit of a vacuum. So here's uh, my last question. And um, it's a serious question. It really is. And it, it, it comes from a conversation I had with Jeff earlier today. So maybe this is more for you, Jeff. Um, you know, we approved $220,000 towards this in our last meeting, and we're talking about another $65,000. So my question is, what kind of a light display, holiday display, could we do on Laurel Street for $285,000? Uh, a pretty good one, although although um, staff can correct me if I'm wrong. I thought it was $110,000. Well, it's $110,000 each year so this okay. year and next year so presumably we can roll that into buying all the lights this year and then what does it cost to put them up next year right so. right yeah no it would it would be a um that would be a significant increase to to uh, what we spend on the night of holiday lights in terms of the lighting um we do the downtown and the um and the christmas tree and uh, you know it's not cheap but um yeah to your point it would definitely be a significant increase either in the amount of lights or in um, the area of lighting, however you wanted to distribute it up. And and is it easier for us to deal with parking and uh, traffic issues on Laurel Street versus Eucalyptus Street? Um, well, I mean, we, I, I would ask uh, Stephen to weigh in on that, but my assumption would be that you have more parking infrastructure, um, obviously, um, in the downtown area and its proximity to larger um, you know, regional arterial and, and freeways and public transit um, provides options that you know, simply couldn't be provided in um, sort of the core neighborhoods of our community. Right. And, and Jeff is exactly correct. I mean, we obviously we have the new Wheeler garage and we have a lot of the surface lots, you know, the, the Wheeler at Clark's Plaza. Plaza. So, so there's a lot of you know parking spaces available, um, you know, to to residents or guests uh, you know, visiting San Carlos. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Okay, thank you, um, Councilmember Collins. I saw your hand go up earlier, and then it came down. I don't know if you had a question or not. No, it it did. But I'll I'll save my comments for the end. Okay, okay. Um, so I, I um. So I want to just kind of circle back to something um, Vice Mayor uh, McDowell was talking about earlier, um, and that had to do that. I feel like this is a little bit of a chicken and the egg, right? So the resolution talks about um, implementing an offsite parking plan to address local traffic issues. Um, traffic and parking, I think it feels to me like are two different things. So I'm really having difficulty reconciling in my mind why adding parking um, and distributing that at different places across the city and then diverting traffic, um, you know, to, you know, basically spread, it'll be spread throughout the city. I can't help but think it's going to end up increasing demand for the, um, for the, you know, what I'm going to call an event because it's kind of turned into an event um, and creating more traffic in other parts of the community. So I walk, you know, by, um, Central Middle School in Arroyo all, all of the time and that Arroyo Street is really narrow. Um, cars would be coming up through and crossing Laurel Street and there's a lot of foot traffic um, that takes place there. Then the other, and Laurel is closed now, right? So then you have San Carlos Avenue where cars would be um, directed to go towards St. Charles. So now that street <laughs> becomes congested. Um, so it, it feels to me like we're, you know, the issue seems to be about the challenge that we have is that we've got a high demand for people to see the, the lights. 
and um, traffic congestion as a result. And now we're gonna increase the footprint for which cars can go. And then we're gonna display signs. And it feels to me like we're just pushing the toothpaste around um, the tube a little bit here. Um, and I'm, I'm just really struggling to see how this solves um, any, any, any problem <laughs> that the residents were concerned about, which was access to their homes, their ability to back out of their driveway if they needed emergency service. How would those, you know, first responders get to them? So I'm just, I'm just really struggling with this one. So Stephen, I don't know if you can shed any light um, or allay any of my concerns. I can, um, yeah. I, I think I can jump in on that one. Uh, we've had a lot of conversations about this at the staff level, and from the beginning, you know, we know that the broader community concerns that we heard about at the um, community meetings that were held really dealt with traffic. And, um, you know, from the beginning, um, other than deploying additional, you know, traffic um, officers into the area to try, try to help facilitate traffic, that there really wouldn't be much we could do if we experienced the same uh, levels of attendance that we saw last year. Um, because it's really just a capacity issue, right? I mean, you just have intersections and, and blocks gridlocking, and, and once that happens, um, you know, there's really nothing much you can do to alleviate it. It's just going to be a, a, a slow, um, a slow situation before it resolves itself. Um, you know, so but in terms of the parking, you know, one of the comments that we heard at your last council meeting from the public. Um, that would be addressed by parking as an example. And it's really how, how I think we see it at the staff level was a comment that a resident made about not being able to have guests come to their home um, during the holidays that have their family over or their friends for uh, holiday events because there was no place to park. Um, this might help with that type of situation. Um, because it's increasing the available capacity of parking in the area. But in terms of flow or being able to park right in front of your home or emergency vehicles, um, you know, I think we need to be cautious about thinking that, you know, any of anything that we can do is really going to change um, the traffic flows in the overall area. It's a small area. There's not a lot of roads that lead in and out of the area. Um, obviously, those roads were never designed for this amount of traffic, um, and, and we're just, you know, it's just not a, a problem that, you know, we can really, the, the infrastructure just doesn't allow for this, the traffic problem to be solved in this particular area, no matter what we do. One-way streets, you know, all you're doing is, you know, with one-way streets would be, you know, making the, you know, the traffic longer on those particular streets. Um, you know, so it's it's just a simply a, a capacity issue. Um, so that would be the one area, you know, in terms of increased parking within the neighborhood that would be that would benefit from this. But but you know, it's unlikely. I mean, we certainly would keep our fingers crossed that you know it has some effect on traffic, um, and we can you know study the numbers a little bit more, and we'll have a lot more eyeballs out to see um, how it might affect. But um, it, it shouldn't be advertised as, you know, a, a big solution to traffic problems because I think the public would be very disappointed in the outcome. Yeah, so Jeff, I, I appreciate that. I, I guess my concern is that, you know, by design, you know, what we know about Laurel Street closure is that people want parking very close to where they're going. <laughs> and these parking lots are, are at least um, half a mile away from the venue. So again, I'm struggling with, I, I hear what you're saying about, um, you know, it would, it would, you know, potentially help those people who live near Eucalyptus Street to be able to entertain over the holidays. But again, I, I just don't, it's not adding up in my mind based on what I know about what everything that we've heard about the lack of parking downtown and Laurel Street. So um, I'm, I'm just really struggling to see where the added value is uh, with this. And to John uh, Councilmember Dugan's point, you know, we we did appropriate one hundred and ten thousand dollars for this for one year um, already, and uh, the costs uh, are potentially going up, you know, significantly on this. With to me, with 
a real lack of, you know, any kind of certainty <laughs> that we're going to get out of it what we're trying to get out of it. So um, I, I've just got some real concerns about that. Council member. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I appreciate all the, the comments around this too, but I, I guess I'd, in, in your thoughts around the parking and congestion, but my rec, I mean, I live right over there as well, you know, on, just on the east side of Burton Park and Arroyo was already being used. All these other ar arteries are already being used to access eucalyptus. People were driving up and people were coming in on two sides off of Orange. So I, I don't know that perhaps on San Carlos Avenue, it is adding more traffic, but some of those streets are already being used already. So I don't know that there's the same impact that we're, we're worried about. You, you might, people might drive up Arroyo that they were gonna go anyway and see if there's actually parking. So I, 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 I think we, to me, we're sort of, this isn't a big experiment that we're trying on some of the things we approved earlier. This seems to be another piece of it. And then we need to figure out, which is why I, I, I'm glad we voted for sort of a one year uh, amount of funding on this so that we're not, we kind of need to come back, step back and see, well, what, and hope staff can come back and say, well, what worked, what didn't work? What lessons do we need to make? Do we abandon everything altogether? Um, so to me, well, I think there are certain things that make sense. I don't think the se private security guards make sense on eucalyptus, but we have, we voted for it. I think there's things we need to try out, see, and then make a decision post next year what what we should be doing and have more data that way. That's just kind of my the way I'm looking at this. That nothing's a silver bullet, but we need to kind of give it a try because the current system's not working. Okay. Um. Thank you. So I don't see any additional um questions from council. Crystal, are there any members of the public who wish to make comment? Yes, there is one hand up. Sonia Elks, you should be able to unmute. Thanks for this discussion. Very interesting. It's a hard problem to solve, and I appreciate everybody's ideas. Um, I just had a thought. We, if somebody was, um, it'd just be nice to be able to tie in the lights on or off to the amount of traffic um, directly. So at a certain point when it starts to impact, when traffic is moving, uh, stop moving, then <laughs> it would be lights over. Um, and I don't know if there's a way to measure the speeds um, on the streets and figure out over the course of the December time, measure those and then, um, you know, maybe even put out a text message that at a certain point, um, the lights have to go off uh, because it becomes a emergency hazard or something like that. Anyway, it's just a thought, but uh, thank you for tackling this difficult problem in creative ways. Thank you, Sonia. Um, Greg, can you, can you talk a little bit about, there was a recommendation made to the community members to think about limiting the duration of the displays in terms of number of days and hours. Um, there's a recommendation from the um, community member that we are um, kind of direct them to do so. Could you talk a little bit about the implications? Well, I think the what we've what we've tried so far is to get voluntary compliance with a with a limitation, a time limitation, and just ask the question. Um, you know, it's found the theory that some of the some of the participants might think that's a good idea to to mitigate against the the traffic you know so it limits the duration on each night we haven't got a response that i'm aware of yet to that so it's sort of a we'll have to see if, if some of the members of the community in that area um will give that a try <clears throat> and i touched on i think some of the legal issues that i think exist for trying to force something like that i think there's a something that we'd really have to study and do uh do a um an analysis to narrowly tailor any kind of a regulation that that might uh, um, affect people's um, expression in in the form of the the lights and the displays that they do that's the legal standard it would have to be very narrow, narrowly tailored Strict scrutiny would probably apply because it's a, a First Amendment issue. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, and I'm, I'm just noticing that it, we're getting close to 10.30, so um, we need a motion to extend the meeting. 
Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor, I move we extend the meeting to 11 o'clock. Second. Thank you. All right. Crystal, can you call the roll? Councilmember Rack? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Vice Mayor McDowell? Yes. Councilmember Dugan? Yes. And Mayor Parmalohan? Yes. And there are no more uh, hands from the public. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, so let's move to council uh, comment and discussion. Council Member Dugan. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, you know, it's just kind of a challenging issue. You know, I, I've always loved the holiday display. I think it's a great example of, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, grassroots level community, something we can be proud of is San Carlos that, you know, this has just kind of uh, come up, but, it, you know, I guess negative externalities would be the word, um, you know, just lots of uh, people aren't happy with, with how it goes down over there and access issues, traffic issues, everything we've been trying to solve, but it's a difficult problem. We have no actual control. I guess I'll, you know, I'm just generally disappointed that we're, you know, eucalyptus is not participating in this process, right? I mean, they're not really at the table. They're not really helping us uh, work with this. If, if we could count on some voluntary limitations or, you know, just some level of, you know, it just, it doesn't feel to me like we can solve this independently um, just by throwing money at it. And, you know, I, I didn't really like, everything we approved last time, I guess I, I'm not really excited about a parking scheme that staff doesn't sound very confident in. And then I, I honestly would like to just throw it up. What have we spent all this money on just making a great display on Laurel? And, you know, I, I, I mean, not just provide something else people might prefer to go to or might go to as well and cut, cut the traffic down just by having something else great going on in town. I mean, I, you know, I think for this kind of money, we could actually do something cool somewhere. Um, and boy, wouldn't that be more fun to try than like parking attendance and signs and, you know, and all this other stuff and police presence. And, you know, I just, I, I would like to think differently on this one. I really would. I'm kind of frustrated, but um, I, I'm like, why not? Why not just do a great display on Laurel with this money? Thank you, Councilmember Duggan. Councilmember Collins? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I, I agree with Councilmember Dugan, except for the display on Laurel Street. I just think that uh, this is a this is a situation that will probably get worse if we spend money on it. Um, I think we're we're just creating another another attraction for people to come and see this. I, I'm, I'm really having I'm really struggling with this. If, if I was going to vote for anything, I would vote for that option, too. But even that I'm not I'm not enthusiastic about it. I think we're just going to create more problems. This is a private celebration on you know the private homes put on every year. Uh, the, the fact that they we sent a letter to them and we got zero response. My word. Uh, I just I, I I have I I find it almost impossible to get enthusiastic about spending any money on a on a, on a parking problem that I think just may make the problem worse. So I wish I could be more positive about it, but I just can't. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Thank you, Council Member Collins. Council Member Rack, and then Vice Mayor Mc... Thank you, Madam Mayor. I guess I had two comments. One, I think that since we've already spent the money or agreed to spend the money on the other part of it, we should try to complete the and look at this holistically. And uh, if we're gonna do it, do it one time. Uh, and do some sort of parking because I do think part of the problem is we we're not trying to get cars off the street. Um, but I, I guess as an alternative, I'd be more than happy to bring up at the next agenda setting item that we rescind all the funding that we approved and go back and let them fend for themselves and not do anything. Because it sounds like that's what Council Member Collins and Council Member Dugan would potentially prefer. And we don't spend any money on this. And we uh, and maybe that's the way to get the response from Eucalyptus is to say okay, we're not going to spend and we're not going to do anything. Because I, I guess, we're, to me, we're doing it sort of a half-baked response by not trying to address the parking. So uh, to me, I think we should spend the money on the parking 
And I think that's actually a better alternative than some of the things that we're spending the money on. I think the traffic control is good. I don't know that some of the other things that we've already appropriated make a lot of sense uh, to me. So that's, uh, I'm gonna certainly make a motion to uh, approve the parking and we'll, I guess we'll see where things are. Vice Mayor McDowell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I feel like things are getting a little contentious. Uh, so I I agree that this year is an experiment and we're so far down the road with this after all of the community dialogues and the outreach and taking public comment and you know we're two meetings into this. I'd, I'd like to see this through this year and then reassess in a big way in January what was successful and what wasn't. Maybe none of it was successful, maybe only small parts of it were, um, but I, I actually would support doing the seven days a week so that we do have kind of that broader overview so that we can take all the data and and make an informed decision in January instead of doing something halfway here and halfway there. Um, with that being said, you know, for hiring parking lot attendants, I would like them to keep track of how many cars are parked each night. Um, I think that that's something that they can do. Um, I think that, you know, if this is successful, I would like to consider charging for parking in the future to offset our costs. Um, I think that, you know, we're really, we've been looking at this um, for so long, and we put a lot of staff time into it, not for the eucalyptus residents per se, although they're a part of this, but for the broader community, because we have heard so much from the broader community about how this event, this holiday event is impacting their lives. They can't have their families over. They've got people parking in front of their driveways. They can't get in and out of their houses. They're worried about emergency response. So, you know, I do think that it's important that we try this year to address this for the broader community that is feeling these impacts very directly. Um, and so that's why I would support trying out this parking solution, um, but being very sensitive to how we put those maps out um, with an effort to not um, make, <laughs> not to double the attendance because we don't want that. We, I would rather keep it, you know, consistent and see if, you know, what we do alleviates the burden. Um, I mentioned that I feel like this is a holiday event. I put lights on my house and hot dog vendors don't show up on my street. I think when hot dog vendors show up on your street, you have an event on your hands. And so I too feel disappointed and frustrated that the eucalyptus residents have not come to the table. Um, I would implore them to reach out to the city. I think that the city is making some really good faith efforts to help, you know, make some improvements here. Um, and I, I agree, I think that they, I think we need to have that discussion. Um, okay, that's it for me, thank you. Right, thank you. So, um, so I guess you know my my perspective on this is that, you know, I, I think that the city um, and and staff and council are going to extraordinary lengths um, to try to address this issue, um, and from everything that I hear from you know Greg, our city attorney, is that you know, these neighbors on Eucalyptus Street have every right to to do these displays. Um, the magnitude of these displays are creating um, adverse impacts on their neighbors, and we're doing our best uh, to step in. And I understand uh, staff sent out 2,500 letters uh, to everybody in the community, and it's interesting and curious to me that no one is on this call tonight uh, to, to weigh in. We have one resident uh, that provided a comment. Um, the issues in my mind that we addressed with the last package had to do with public safety and health. Um, in this particular case, um, again, I think the safety issue again is the traffic, but we can't, we don't have any control over how many people decide to come into San Carlos. So long as those lights are displayed every single night, every day of the week from Thursday, from Thanksgiving to Christmas. Um, and, um, I, and I also believe that this isn't a scientific experiment. We're, we're not going to necessarily be able to isolate uh, what worked and what didn't work. Um, we don't have a, a true baseline of how many people came in last year uh, to visit the lights. Uh, we know that there was ex extraordinary circumstances. Those circumstances may be different. So I don't, I don't know that we're going to know 
whether or not any of these measures are, have, are gonna have a, a, a real uh, positive impact on uh, the community or not. I, I don't think there's any way for, we may not be able to dif discern it. So I just wanna kind of put that out there, right? We don't have any kind of a control uh, whenever you do any kind of experiment, you have a control. We don't have a control in this case. Um, and um, and I'm also a little bit worried about Christmas Eve at St. At St. Charles. Um, how, are, how, how are we gonna make sure that the people who park in that parking lot are not going to see the Christmas lights and how will that be managed? Um, I don't know that we're gonna be able to control that after a full month of people being able to park in that parking lot. Now, I don't know that that's our problem to solve tonight, but I'm just putting it out there. So um, I, I just, I don't know. I just, this, this um, I, I don't know what more I can say about it, but it's just, it's, it's just a conundrum, right? Um, I know people like these lights, but it's causing a lot of problems and the city's doing its best effort. And I, I don't know that we're gonna be able to, uh, mitigate the impacts of them. So um, Mayor, uh, Council Member Collins, if you'd like to make a comment. Yeah, I, I just wanted to respond a little bit. Um, you know, Jeff informed me that he sent out 2,500 letters to the community. Nobody called, nobody, nobody showed up tonight, basically. These are well publicized meetings, but we can have problems either way. We, if, if we put in one of these parking plans, um, it could prove to be such a problem, such a disaster that we decide, you know, we're not going to do this next year. Then we don't do it next year. And everybody says, why didn't you continue the parking? So it's one of these, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't situations. Um, if we're going to approve any kind of a parking situation, I, I would rather go with the minimalist approach and do the the one where it's limited to uh I guess it was what a 16 17 day period I I I would probably be okay with that um but again if we do it and it doesn't work and we stop doing it then we we have a real problem for for years this thing's gone on for years and years and years and we haven't really done anything now we stuck our toe into it now we're going to stick two toes into it um uh, it's it's not something that I'm really comfortable with. So if there's a motion for the lesser parking plan, I think I'll vote for that. But otherwise, I I, I can't support uh, the more robust one. Thank you, Councilmember Dugan. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. I, you know, I guess where I'm at on this is I'm really uh, hung up on the uh, the parking signage. I mean, you know, these parking lots are not so adjacent. That they're going to be naturally used so then we have to put these signs up and i i just I, you know i agree with vice mayor mcdowell and others i mean i i don't think you can put these big signs up announcing parking for an event and not expect a lot more people to follow the signage and 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 i guess maybe i'd like to just parse that out i mean i'm all for if we think it could help let's try it let's see if it helps and yeah, I agree, Ron. You know, if if we put it out there and then decide not to next year, we'll take some lumps over that. But I mean, we're we're feeling our way through this thing. So for me, I'm just kind of on that narrow issue. Do we think the signage is going to make the problem worse or not? I, I actually tend to think it makes it worse, and that's kind of how I think I need to make this decision. You know, do we have a consensus at least on that? Do we think the signs make it worse or not? Council Member Collins, and then I and then I think we would. need to move to a motion. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the signs would make it worse. I, I I think you think you make the parking available. Let's not advertise it. Let's see where that goes. I, I really, I mean, the, the things are bad now. I just think we start advertising, it just gets so much worse. I, I won't say anymore. We, you're right. It's getting late. We need to make a decision. Okay, I'll, I'll make a motion if that's. I think things are. Um, I move to adopt resolution 2021 dash 101. 100 resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos appropriate. Do I need to give the specific funding amount if we're going to go on the, the lower numbers? It would be preferred, so it's clear direction. I would think. Okay, it's not written that way. So, what can someone tell me what that number is? Is it 40,000? Identify it. 
if we can just identify which one you want to work you program think parking scenario so scenario two, two. Okay. Yeah. Resident City Council of City Council of uh, City of San Carlos appropriating funding from the general fund unassigned fund balance of for fiscal year 21-22 to implement offsite to implement offsite parking plan number two to address local traffic issues impacting the community from the Eucalyptus Avenue holiday celebration. Do we need any additional language about signage? I guess what motion are you proposing, Adam, with or without signage? Well, I mean, I assume we need to have some kind of signs at the parking lot saying park here, right? I mean, but you're talking about directional signs. Is that right, Ron? You, you don't uh, I'd ask John. I, I'm, uh, oh. I mean, that's true. Yeah, I, I mean, there's got to be some signage so people know to run, park. That should be left up to staff. I, yeah, I don't I, think we need to talk yeah. about language on signs. It's too specific. Okay. I, no, I agree. I agree with Sarah. Let's let staff work that out. I mean, that means we will have signs. Right? Yeah, well, but maybe we won't have a lot of signs. Yeah. I'll second Adam's motion. Okay, any further discussion? I'll just say that I will support this just simply because I think we'll either find out if it works or not. So let's try it out. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll support it, but very reluctantly, and I don't know that we're going to get any answers. So I'm going to set my expectations and be surprised if we get some, some insights out of this. I'm willing to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Crystal. Councilmember Dugan? Yes. Vice Mayor McDowell? Yes. Councilmember Rack? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. And Mayor Palmer Lohan? Yes. Okay, um, so that takes us to 9A uh, agenda setting. Um, Items discussed in this agenda setting section will be considered by the council for place, placement on a future agenda. No action will be taken on these items at this meeting. Uh, the item here is consideration of agendizing an item to discuss appropriating $151,000 for rent forbearance to assist with evictions associated with COVID-19. So you, uh, council may recall that uh, early in the days of the pandemic, uh, we created a, a rental relief uh, program uh, for people who were impacted by uh, COVID. Uh, since then, the um, obviously the pandemic has been extended um, much longer than I think anybody had anticipated, um, as was described earlier tonight in a previous agenda item. More recently, the um, eviction moratorium has been over, um, has, has expired. And we know from recent actions council has taken, we do have uh, people in our community who um, are, um, you know, are stretched uh, pretty thin and um, the economy is still recovering. So I'd like um, consideration for this council to think about putting uh, this item on a future agenda for consideration. I'd be in favor. To support it. Thank you. Council member Rack. I just, I, I'm not opposed to it. I said, and maybe, and maybe I can't ask this because of it's in general setting, but I don't know that we ever got a report on the initial set of funding that we did. So is there money left from that? And I'm not opposed to adding more. I just would want to understand if the first program actually was successful or how that worked. Jeff or Greg? Uh, yeah, I can um, give you an update. As of a couple of weeks ago, there was about um, $40,000 of the about $115,000 that you put into the program. Um, as I understand it, um, what the county has tried to do is use that money as a last resort so that um, they plug uh, applicants into other available funding sources first if they qualify. And then when they don't qualify or can't access any of those other sources, they've then used our money. Um, so I think if the council, and it sounds like you're going to be considering this. So when you consider this again, um, you know, in addition to a dollar amount, you'll probably want to think about like resetting the shot clock. If people have already participated once in the program, you may want to do like a refresh so that, you know, the same people might be able to participate again in the next year here. Um, uh, so we'll get you when this comes back, um, any updated numbers from the county. 
on additional usage because there is some anticipation that we might see the money get used more as other programs are drying up. Great. I'm happy to support it as well. Thank okay. you, Jeff. For Thank that. you. Thank you. I'm happy to support it as well, Madam Mayor. Thank you for bringing this forward. All right. Thank you. Council Member Dugan. Uh, yeah, it sounds like we're green on this one. So uh, I do have an agenda item that, you know, I actually think must relate to this. I was at the Council of the Cities meeting, I think in June, and uh, our Congress uh, woman, Jackie Spear, gave a presentation and, and, and even handed out a list of uh, the uh, federal appropriations down to every city in the county. And uh, the number next to San Carlos at that time back in June was $5.3 million. And I guess I would just like to get on the agenda. Um, you know, what is this federal money? Is it coming? Do we know how much? And, you know, and what do we know at this, you know, when, when it's presented to us, I'd like to know, like, how can this money be spent? And, you know, where, how are we going to go about determining that? That's, you know, that's a, that's a significant impact on our budget. And I just think we need an update of where, where that's all at. Okay. So, uh, council member Diggin, are you, are you proposing a report to council on, on that? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a, a report to council on uh, the federal uh, relief funds, uh, how much and how we might be able to use them. Okay. Um, kind of, uh, I think that's coming anyway. So okay. I'm, we'll just let uh, staff, you know, get their act together. And, and when they, when they have information for us, uh, happy to hear it. Council member Rack. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I guess, uh, John, I appreciate bringing this up. I guess my concern is we keep kind of slipping on what is the uh, agreed upon agenda setting process. This seems to be happening more often. And so I, I, I just want to get some clarification from Greg so that we're not getting ourselves in any issues on this. I'm not opposed to you know, getting, a, as, as Ron stated, a report on this. But I, I would like us to kind of yes. follow the process that we yes. agreed to. Yes, um, thank you. Councilmember Rack, I, I, this might be, um, you know, the balancing that the council has to do about, you know, when and how urgent something is, I think is part of this process. Mm -hmm. So this might be one of those ones that we could put it on agenda setting next time so we could have a, a more detailed discussion about what exactly the council wants. Uh, and then it could go on to a future agenda when staff's ready, as opposed to certain items where, hey, we if we have a deadline at the end of the year, you know, we might want to say, hey, we, we've got to act on that one quicker. And just because someone hadn't uh, reached out to Jeff during the week and thought of it at a meeting or we had a public comment on it, we, we can try and address those those types of matters um, then. Because uh, I, I have a feeling that once we have the money in hand, and I'm not sure we have it in hand, but um, I don't think we do, um, but we would, you know, the uh, staff would definitely bring it forward to you, uh, as Council Member Collins said. Mm -hmm. So, in short, I think that this might be one of those ones that we could put it on agenda setting next time, and then have a, a more robust discussion about what is really desired, and and maybe we could do a little bit of homework in advance about that question that came up earlier tonight about are there any mandates, or are there any other things that we have to spend it on? Yeah. Thank you. And, and just to, just for my own edification, since Council Member Rock brought it up, uh, there was a sense of urgency around the, 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 the subcommittee for um, staff uh, re retention issues. So Greg, could you, in the context of your answer, help us understand where that one fits in as well? Because I'm hearing from Council Member Rock, he wants some consistency about how we approach these and that one was handled uh, differently than the proposal from Council Member Dugan. So. I just want to make sure that we're being consistent. No, I, I that's a, a good point. Um, and it, we're, like I said, I think we're trying to balance the desires of the council um, to, to uh, you know, to move on something more quickly. Uh, and so it's it's your call, really, when you when you talk about that. I mean, because it's not really improper to agendize something at a meeting that came up or a council member thought of it's just the the safe harbor allows you to talk about the reasons to that you might want to agendize something in more detail because we've got it on the agenda as an item even though it may be limited it's still there whereas it just comes off at the 
you know, it comes up during a meeting, you really can't talk about in great detail the particulars of the item because it hasn't been put on the agenda at all. So it's it's really gives you more freedom to to talk about the propriety of putting something on uh, an agenda and dealing with the staff time and all the other issues that we that we've grappled with over time. But again, it's just not prohibited. It's just I you know I, I so I'm, I'm trying to let you move things forward if if you want, but because it's not really prohibited, but. You know, I think you, the council has to weigh how important it is and how quickly you want to see something. Okay, thank you. All right, Councilmember Rack, does that address your concern? Uh, it does, and, and no, I appreciate that. It sounds like if it's going on in the context of an agendized item, it's, a little, it's handled a little bit differently. Uh, and then, John, I think on your side, I'm not opposed to supporting it, so I think if we can put it on the agenda, if you're comfortable putting it on the agenda for the next meeting, I'd be happy to support it. I just want to try to get us back on track with the process, if you're okay with that. Uh, I, I'm okay with that. I don't see an urgent desire, and I agree, uh, Ron. I'm sure, you know, we're going to be told about this eventually. I guess I'm just a little surprised. It feels like three months has gone by. But uh, I, I guess, though, Adam, I don't want to set a precedent in that way, not with regard to what I'm suggesting, but just in general. I think it's okay for us to you know, have a very narrow, limited discussion like we did tonight and decide, hey, maybe we do want a new subcommittee and not really go into detail. So I'm not sure we want to say we're never going to do that, you know, because I think sometimes we will want to do that. That's all. I, I, but I think what Greg was saying, John, was that if it's in the context of an agendized item, then there's more um, flexibility. I see. Yeah, we, 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 we have yeah. something random so, at the end of the meeting. Yeah, that's the point um, I was trying to make. Yeah. That, that you that if it's if we have a proposed agenda item that's on the agenda, you have much more freedom to talk about the implications of it and what you want, and then you get a clear direction to staff. I mean, if, uh, there's been times in the past where where something comes up and and we're not answering your question as thoroughly because we couldn't debate what you really wanted when you want when right you but the distinction yeah. well, being made is that we talked about employee relations therefore an employee subcommittee which is kind of out of the blue right that wasn't on the agenda but it's close enough to something that was on the agenda is that the distinction yeah, I, yeah I mean I, I I think that's a, not inappropriate to, to set up a subcommittee um you know and, and because you're not really making a decision other than setting up a subcommittee and that's the, the discussions limited when you're talking about that naturally but but I, I you know just we've had over the years all kinds of agenda items come up and that's I think that when the Novato case came out a few years ago uh, the court really gave a good analysis of uh, of, of this issue um, in the in in that case the, the council talked for 20 minutes about whether or not to put something on the agenda and the court said you know that's really not appropriate to, to do it that way um, and they created a safe harbor that that I think I think works in most cases but it's 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 not a hard and fast rule that the court has set up it, it's just a it's much safer for you to have something that you can have the when I the, in other words you can have a fifteen or twenty minute conversation about something that you kind of put on the agenda as something that you're considering whether to to move forward. On. Yeah. No, thank. No, it makes sense. Yeah. I'm fine with this. We'll talk about this next agenda setting. Uh, thank you. Right. Um, if there's anything else, I'm going to ask that we extend the meeting. So, choice is yours. <laughs> Close for six Adam minutes. Mayor, I move we adjourn <laughs> this meeting. How is that? <laughs> I will second. Can I second that uh, motion, Greg? Or should we talk I'll about that process too? You got my second. <laughs> <laughs> no. You can just gavel it. <laughs> All right. Let me. I haven't used this in a while, so I'm going to go for it tonight. All right. All right. Good night. Good night, Thank everyone. you. Good night. Good night. Good night.